Welcome everyone to Nerd of the Rings. We have a very exciting interview with us today. We've got Daniel Faulkner of Weta Workshop. He is he was a designer on the Lord of the Rings. He's currently the uh, collectibles art director there. And he's also an author. If you've seen the behind the scenes books that have come out over the years from the Hobbit trilogy and beyond. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, it's my sincere pleasure. So Daniel, I'm curious, I, I love asking this question of people. Um, so how were you first introduced to the world of Tolkien? So I, uh, my memory is that I was around 11 or 12 and we'd done, actually that's not true. When I was 10, we did The Hobbit at my school. Uh, that, that basically the teacher read a, like a chapter every day and we all would, would draw to it and write about it. It was part of our schoolwork and I loved it. It was fantastic, I'm like, this is awesome. But then I remember when we finished that, my mother said to me, well, if you enjoyed that, there's this other book that you probably really like, which is kind of like a sequel to The Hobbit. It's called The Lord of the Rings. She handed me this like this vast tome <laughs> that she had when she was a kid. And the cool thing was it was like dog-eared and there were pages falling out. And it was like it was like this really well-loved object. Yeah. Um, and so handing it to me, I I don't know, there was a, there was a gravitas to it at that moment. Um, and she knew me so well, being my mother, of course I loved it. So, and I devoured that thing over, um, I think it was a holiday break. And so we were traveling around the country as a family, uh, going to visit relatives and that kind of stuff, and, you know, hours in the car. And you're not supposed to read in the car because you get sick. Right. I tell my kids this all the time. I'm always like, stop reading in the car, you make yourself sick. But I, I did it. And so I didn't make myself sick, but I didn't care because I was just glued to that book. And as, as I'm reading it, you know, we're driving through mountains and stuff like that and mm. gorgeous scenery and, and gorges and, and, and valleys and that sort of thing. And, and I'm in Middle Earth, you know, I'm reading this book and I'm looking out the window and I'm like, oh, that's the Misty Mountains we're driving past right now as I'm in those chapters and stuff. So it was an, an it was a very immersive experience for me reading that book at that age. And mm -hmm. um, I was very lucky that uh, my mother was an art teacher. Uh, she always had encouraged me to be imaginative and, and think about and draw things that I was imagining. So, so that world really came alive for me. And and uh, I guess coming out of that, it was just it became a favorite for me. You know, I loved it. I immediately went and found the Silmarillion when I was like twelve, and I started wow. reading that and and got about I think I think I got about two chapters and went, oh, this is this is hard. <laughs> I love it. But I'm struggling with it. But I came back to it a few, a couple of years later, and I think, I think when I was about thirteen or fourteen, I came back to it, read it again, and I got it. Like yeah. I really got it. Um, and uh, yeah, all of those books I've reread multiple times in the years since because it's. I think the thing about that world that I'm sure so many of us as fans can relate to is, you read a fantasy book, it paints a picture of a world, you imagine it, and you enjoy it. You can okay. go back and read it again, and then next time you read it, you can go a little deeper and see things that you didn't catch the first time around. But with Tolkien's writing, like you just you never bottom out. Like you can just keep yeah. finding, oh yeah, finding more and more depth the more you read. And there are all these thanks to Christopher Tolkien and other authors. There are these amazing books that just add further depth to that world that really plumb not only J.R.R. Tolkien's writing, but then his thought process and his influences and. And you just keep going and keep going deeper. And, you know, <laughs> I worry next time I flip over a page, like a barrel going to jump out or something, right? Because I've gone too deep. But like, you can just keep going. I, I just fell completely in love with that world and, and became so immersed in it that it was, it dominated my imagination for, for years or through my formative years as a, as a child and as a, as a teen. And, and then, I mean, thank good, thank the, the, the Lord, you know, thank, thank yeah. the, the world. Um, I've managed to make a career out of it because I don't know what else I'd be doing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not qualified for anything else. <laughs> oh, that's so good. Um, yeah, I, I can, yeah, no kidding. I can re totally relate to, uh, you know, I've, I've purposely read Lord of the Rings when, you know, our, our family in the past has gone on vacation to someplace like Tennessee and they have the smoky mountains there. Awesome. And I purposely will, will stop at a certain point in the book because I want to read parts of the Misty Mountains while I'm in the Smoky Mountains. Yes. It's yes. so magical. It does, it does put you in it, doesn't it? In a way, yeah. I mean, you can your imagination is powerful, but to actually be surrounded by it is something that's something else. Yeah. yeah. And of course, you guys down there in New Zealand, obviously, are essentially surrounded by it just being down there. I mean, that's what, oh. you know, the entire world has come to associate with how Middle Earth looks is how is New Zealand. 
It's funny, isn't it? It's weird. I, I guess because in many ways, and I, I suppose this is why it kind of worked. Um, well, for me anyway, um, obviously all our experiences are subjective, but but it, it worked for me because I think New Zealand does look a lot like, and it shares a latitude with, you know, Europe. Mm -hmm. um, it looks a lot like parts of Europe, but I guess because humans have lived here for less time, uh, it's got a wilder quality to it. So I guess being a wilder version of Europe, well, that to my mind, that is Middle Earth, right? So. Right. Um, certainly the way I imagine it. So yeah, it's it's true. You look out the window and go, wow, that, that looks like somewhere. Um, yeah. And Peter was able to, Peter Jackson was able to make full use of that in his, uh, his exploration of the country. Absolutely. So tell us, um, you know, obviously you, you had this wonderful foundation that was uh, set up by your mother of, you know, just this deep love of Tolkien. Um, so how, Take us from from that point to your journey to uh, working at Weta. How did that come mm -hmm. about? So I guess part of the whole thing um, with growing up with an art teacher as a parent and somebody who encourages you to dream and imagine. You know, uh, we lived we lived in a uh, quite a forested area, and so you know, outside my bedroom window was trees. You know, and I could walk for a kilometer through the trees before I hit another house and stuff like that. Go exploring. So was always encouraged to go out into that environment and imagine. And because I used to draw all the time, I'd come back and I, you know, my mother would ask me things like, as we were on a walk, you know, what do you think lives in the hole in that tree? You know, go back and draw it. And I go back into my room and draw some little weird creature that lived in there. So, so I grew up imagining alternate worlds, um, which set me on a path, although I was unaware at the time, towards the film and television industry. Yeah. And I think it was seeing um, behind the scenes documentaries for movies like the Star Wars movies and mm. uh, the Dark Crystal Labyrinth. Um, and Jim Henson was a huge influence on, on me. Um, and realizing, oh, not only can you go and watch those movies and be transported to another world, but actually if you watch these behind the scenes documentaries, there are people who spend their lives making this stuff. And it's yeah. their job basically to take something that appears on the page in a script or a book uh, and give it life and try and make it into something that you as an audience can experience and be immersed in. Um, and so I think through my high school years, I started to realize, well, well that would be an incredible thing to do as a job. Um, and uh, I, I went. I actually went to uh, university and studied by studied biology first because I figured mm. I can't do that as a job here in New Zealand. You know, we're yeah. miles from anywhere. And then and then realized no, I, I had my priorities switched. I because I was doing science as a. I figured science would be my career, art would be my hobby. And then I was like, no, that's I've got it wrong. I need art to be my career, and I'm I'm passionate about the science stuff, but I can read books in my you know my own time sort of thing. So I changed, went to art school instead, did a design degree, and in my final year of that design degree, which is more aimed towards advertising and um, uh, print media and that kind of thing, but my tutors were understanding and flexible enough that they allowed me to sort of twist it towards film and television. I had imagined that I would probably come out of that course and have to go overseas to find work. You know, I was looking mm -hmm. at LA and, and uh, the UK and that kind of stuff and thinking that's where I'd have to go. But in my final year of working uh, in my, in my degree, design degree, I learned that there were actually companies in New Zealand making stuff. And at the time, the Hercules and Xena TV shows were being made. Oh, yeah. I'm um, really close to where I lived and and through somebody, a friend of a friend, somebody who knew my mother and, uh, you know, um, knew somebody who was working on it and I was able to um, call them up and ask about the possibility of doing some work experience, which was a requirement of my, of my degree. And uh, as I understood later, the answer is usually no. Yeah. But <laughs> for whatever reason, because I was very fortunate, the answer when I called them was yes. And so I spent a week with them in different departments, you know, the art department, uh, the working with the set designer at one point, working in the costume department, just getting a little bit of a sample, like a um, chocolate box sort of taster uh, <laughs> sample of the departments and realized how cool it was. But, but what I also discovered was there was this company in Wellington doing the creatures for the show. And I'm like, wow, what? <laughs> what? What? Um, and so by chance, I happened to, again, another case of, of um, good fortune. I ran yeah. into Richard Taylor and you've had him on your show. You know what a yeah. passionate guy he is and oh, that yeah. passion is great. And we just clicked immediately. Like I was this, you know, 21 year old, really, really green kid, um, just about to finish his design degree. Um, but I like 
monsters. I was just mm -hmm. a nerd for creatures and film and television and that kind of stuff, love Star Wars, all that sort of thing. And so he was there working on some creatures and I just sort of, you know, sidled up to him and got chatting and we just, we clicked. And he's like, well, why don't you, because he's a lovely man that is, he's like, well, why don't you come and hang out with us for a week and see if you like it? So <laughs> I couldn't believe it. So I went to Wellington, spent uh, a week at Weta Workshop. They at the time had one designer and a couple of sculptors. Um, yeah. They were mostly doing work for Hercules and Zeno. They'd obviously done some of Peter Jackson's films at that point, but but relatively small projects. Mm -hmm. and they were in a position where they were just about to start on a feature film version of King Kong, a new a new version of King Kong that Peter was going to direct. This was 1996. Yeah. And they realized that they needed to put together actually a team of designers rather than just have one guy. Um, and so, it was for me it was a case of being in the right place at the right time i was just yeah. about to graduate i had kind of pushed my whole degree into drawing monsters and creatures and stuff like that so i had the right stuff that they were looking for and richard was purposefully looking for young designers who uh did not have industry experience that came from outside yeah. the hollywood um uh, model because yeah. he wanted people who didn't come with an existing um recognizable aesthetic mm -hmm. he wanted who who you know didn't know any better and so would try new stuff and do different things um uh so so ignorance in this case was a blessing um and so I, again I, I guess i just happened to be in the right place at the right time so i joined their team our king kong fell over almost immediately as soon as our, mm. wellington's about an hour's flight or eight hours drive from auckland where i lived mm -hmm. so i but i packed up all my stuff and moved down there uh, moved into a flat with some of the other guys and started on King Kong. And as I was starting on it, they're like, oh, the, the movies, Universal's pulled the plug. It's not going to get made now. It might come back. And it did about uh, 10 yeah. years later. It came back. But um, <clears throat> at the time, was, and I just moved there, and Richard's like, oh, I'm sorry, man. The work has now evaporated. But just stick around because I'm sure we'll pick something else up. So don't go mm -hmm. anywhere. We'd like to keep you. Uh, and within you know, a very short time thereafter, I think it was a case of just a couple of weeks, Peter Jackson actually came back and said, well, King Kong's fallen over. I'm really gutted about it because I'm passionate about it. But we've been talking about doing The Hobbit. And, and I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? Are you kidding me? I mean, I love King Kong, but The Hobbit? Yeah. Uh, so um, And so we actually started just doing a few initial sketches. Um, we had Bernie Wrightson, who's a famous um, artist. He, he, um, he, would, he was kind of our lead artist on King Kong, that the rest of us, mm. because while we're all very green and that was good, it helps to have one guy in the room who has some experience uh, and yeah. can mentor the rest of the team. So Bernie Wrightson was our mentor. Um, they mm. brought him in from the States. Bernie uh, you know, is well known for... Uh, his incredible work, you know, on Universal Monster kind of creatures and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Uh, amazing things, made comic books, all kinds of stuff. An insane artist. He was our John Howe and Alan Lee on what was going to be King uh, Kong. Yeah. Um, and so Bernie started doing Hobbit designs uh, because he was around. Um, yeah. And uh, and that was all looking pretty good for a few weeks. We, and the rest of us were just about to kick in and join him as well when um, Peter got the call and, and was told, oh, <clears throat> actually, the Hobbit's a bit complicated. There's a rights yeah. issue there. Um, the distribution rights are split between a few different companies. It's going to be a bit more complicated than we, we thought because the plan at that point was that Miramax, the company that was that was uh, you know funding it at the time, mm -hmm. was going to be one Hobbit movie, and if that did well, they'd do two Lord of the Rings movies afterwards as sequels. Yeah. Um, but because the rights were a bit complicated on the Hobbit. They were like, you know, we're just going to skip past that. We're just going to go straight to Lord of the Rings yeah. uh, because the rights are easy on that one. We, we've got it all. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, we'll do two Lord of the Rings movies. And and I'm like, well, The Hobbit's great, but The Lord of the Rings is even better. Yeah. So, wow. Uh, <laughs> I just couldn't believe that I was in the right place at the right time where this was happening to be a part of it. Um, yeah. And from then it was really just a case of, oh, my goodness, how do we do this subject matter mm -hmm. justice? Like yeah. how... When you've got something that personally for me i was so in love with and revere mm -hmm. so greatly but then also knowing that the rest of the world does as well yeah um and here we are just a bunch of kids down in new zealand most of us almost no film or tv experience mm -hmm. and we it lands in our lap this this holy grail of projects yeah um so it was both daunting but then also hugely exciting because you know we didn't know what we didn't know, right? We, right. we <laughs> didn't know enough to be frightened, as frightened as we should have yeah. been. <laughs> so, and we had great leaders because yeah. Peter's very inspirational. 
-hmm. Richard's profoundly inspirational, inspires enormous loyalty um, in his crew. Uh, he invests so much faith in us that I, you know, I'm so thankful. Um, this is a really long answer. But no, this I, is I great. Yeah. The story. Um, but one of the things that I think made it a little bit easier for us was um, we suggested to Pete that what it might be a good idea to do is just at the very beginning of the project, grab a whole bunch of stuff and pull it together, bring in together all the visual materials that we could find mm -hmm. for how other people had imagined this world in the past so that we could at least get a look at what was done, what Peter responded to, what he didn't respond to. And that would help kind of guide us so that we knew what direction to head in with our own aesthetic yeah. explorations. And, and what immediately became apparent was that um, the artwork of John Howe and Alan Lee uh, mm -hmm. Also Ted Nathan, but but we we could only get two guys, and that was going to be John and Alan. Um, kind of just jumped above yeah. almost everything else, and I think probably because they'd been illustrating the books for all the years, and many of us had read those books and grown right. up looking at those illustrations. Had the calendars on our walls. Yeah, that's like the, the trinity of uh, of Tolkien illustrators. There, yeah. they really are, and so they're the worlds they imagined. Um, that that's what Lord, that's what the Lord of the Rings smelled like. That's what it looked like. That's what it, it felt like to all of us. And so um, that became our, I guess, uh, our style guide for what mm -hmm. the world should be. And so then Peter was like, "Well, why don't we call those guys and see if they'll come down and lead our team?" Which yeah. again, as I mentioned before, having Bernie Wrightson as we began on on King Kong was hugely important to us. Uh, I think um, because we were so green, uh, having having these guys actually come who were experienced illustrators but weren't necessarily film industry people. So again, they had a freshness there, um, but they had the experience. And John, in particular, has a tremendous knowledge of um, mm -hmm. medieval history and and weaponry and armor and that kind of stuff. So he was. Uh, both those gentlemen were amazingly uh, um, powerful engines of creativity, mm -hmm. but also knowledge and teaching for the rest yeah. of us. Because uh, we're all kids, you know. Right. We didn't know. Yeah. We started drawing armor. The first armor that that I or any of my colleagues started drawing was stuff that looked like was out of the Dungeons and Dragons source books because <laughs> that's what we'd grown up reading. Right. And that's what, we what armor looked like. And so when John and Alan came in and uh, and just worked with us, and John's like, "Well, why are you drawing it that way?" And I'm like, "Well, that's the way I imagine." He says, "Yeah, but you need to understand how armor works in order to mm. be able to draw and design armor correctly." And so he's like, why would you have a spike on your shoulder? I'm like, because it looks cool. He's like, yeah, but when you raise your head, it's going straight into the side of your, of your head, you know, right. You up, right? So, so like, you know, why? Yeah. So, so that, what that really did, and uh, coupled with the fact that Peter's philosophy for the films was, don't look at fantasy for reference, mm. look at history, mm. look at historical epics like Braveheart and Rob Roy and, and, mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. That's our benchmark for, because we will need to ground this world in a reality. Mm -hmm. If we just go, if we go hard into the fantasy aspects of it, we're going to create something that will be, I, I think, too confronting for audiences and, and difficult mm -hmm. to get into. We just get like, you just smash your audience over the head with these strange names and bizarre visuals. And they're like, yeah. what is this? You know, so Peter made the decision early on that this had to be a, a, a grounded, real world that felt mm -hmm. just like a slightly different version of our own world, which I think was very, very astute, very clever. Yeah. I didn't, we didn't know any better at the time. We just, okay, cool boss. Yeah. Um, so then having John and Alan to guide us into that and help keep it grounded mm -hmm. meant that then we could drop little fantasy elements in and they would ping and yeah. they would work and it'd be like the spice in the, in the cake, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. So that, Hugely uh, important having those guys on the project. We all learned a huge amount. And and while when they very first turned up, we were all like tiptoeing around them because they were our, our, our um, childhood idols. Right. So, <laughs> these amazing <laughs> celebrities in the room. Yeah. <laughs> they were. They were. Uh, very, very quickly, we realized what lovely, giving, friendly people they were. And and uh, and we knew that we were on a good level when the, the, um, uh, the cheeks started flying backwards mm. and forwards. You know, people started to give each other uh, little snarky comments and stuff like that. You're like, <laughs> we're comfortable in each other's company now. <laughs> we can relax our guards a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, so I, I found myself in a tremendous family, supported yeah. by amazing artists, amazingly inspired, uh, inspiring people, um, and learned just a, a huge amount. But every day, as a Tolkien nerd, I was pinching myself, going, I cannot believe I'm here. Yeah. Dream. I. I yeah, dream. It was a dream come true to work on that project. Absolutely. Incredibly yeah. I, oh my gosh. Yeah. And I, I love that you, um, you bring up the fact that, you know, Peter 
wisely, you know, said, we're going to ground this thing in reality, look at history, not fantasy, because I think that's a huge pull of Tolkien's world already is that it feels so real and it feels like it could be a history that actually happened, you know, centuries and centuries ago. It does. It does. It makes you start looking sideways at your colleagues and going, well, are you part dwarf or, you know, <laughs> you know, like it does feel like it could be our world. Um, and I think the other thing that he did by bringing on Alan Lee and John Howe, I think that was very, very clever too, because not only did it obviously give us a grounding in that we had these, these guys who knew this world very, very well already and could, mm -hmm. could also mentor the rest of us who were so young, but, but also the world had grown up reading those books and seeing those yeah. calendars and seeing those illustrations that these guys had done. And so if Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings looked like those books, mm -hmm. then it, it, the audience had we'd already been primed to accept right. his vision of Middle Earth as something that they're like, well, yeah, of course, that's what it looks like. That's how we right. always imagined it as well, you know, because you've subliminally been kind of <laughs> seated yeah. with that artwork already. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that was a conscious part, a choice on Peter's mm -hmm. part because he's the kind of person that doesn't, uh, he never spoke about that, but it's the mm -hmm. kind of thing, he doesn't do stuff unconsciously. He's a very, right. very clever person, a very strategic person. I think I think that was a, a clever choice on his part. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you mentioned, um, you know, the uh, the pressure and the, the challenge. And even though you guys were mostly, you know, um, naive enough to not, you know, fully realize all the, the extent of the pressure. Um, I'm sure, you know, that comes with some challenges, you know, when you're, when you're designing things. So what was your most challenging project involved uh, in bringing Lord of the Rings to life? Mm, that's a good question. I mean, I always saw myself as kind of serving three masters um, because, uh, because this is not an original story. It's a, it's a script that's adapted from a book that, the, that many people around the world have read. I felt like when I was, any time I was drawing something for Peter, if his question was, what does dwarven armor look like? What does an elven sword look like? What, what does this character or creature look like? Um, you know, and our team had to, you know, answer that question together. Yeah. My, I felt like one, I was trying to give Peter something that he liked that was yeah. going to match with his imagination of that world. Two, because I'm a fan of it myself, I wanted to create something that that I was comfortable with and that, that didn't jar with my own imagination of that right. world. And then three, I was serving the text, I guess, but then also, in a way, I'm drawing something for people I've never met yet, people I never will meet, who will go and mm -hmm. see these films. And 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 that's Middle Earth for them. That's how they're going to see it. And particularly the people who've never read the books. Because, yeah. like, if you've read the books, you imagine Frodo a certain way. And then you see the film, and it either the way Frodo is in the film either works for you or it doesn't. Right. But if you've never read those books and you go see the film, you see Frodo, you go, okay, that's Frodo. Mm -hmm. Then when you pick up the book to experience it for the first time because you enjoyed the film so much, you can't help but see Frodo the way he was projected in the films. So mm -hmm. if we screw it up and we do something that's just not quite right, it's gonna yeah. it ruins the experience not only of the movie but of the books for those people for the first time. So I felt very strongly that we had to we had to really try and invest the spirit of Tolkien in everything we were doing, which is, mm -hmm. is a difficult thing. Um, Tolkien writes very sometimes he gives you really specific details. Mm -hmm. Uh, but most of the time, he's very uh, suggestive in yeah. what he in what he writes. He he conjures imagery in your mind, but it's amorphous, and it it gives mm -hmm. you room as as the reader to fill in the blanks and kind of populate that world yourself. Right. So we had to try and fill in those blanks, and uh, you know, on film, you literally have to design everything. So yeah, you have to you have to suddenly give form to something that's uh, that's intentionally amorphous. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was challenging across the whole thing. I think for me. The most challenging stuff were the earliest designs because in the beginning we were still finding our feet and trying to figure out what the rules of the world were. Uh -huh. What is some? What? How does something look? And and how far does it? Can you stray before you're out of the bounds of the world? Mm -hmm. You know, how real does it have to be? How fantasy can it be? Uh, what materials can you use? How crazy can you go? Yeah. And at the beginning, we didn't know any of that stuff. And also because we were on that steep learning curve of coming straight out of reading Dungeons & Dragons books, which are great, mm -hmm. and that aesthetic's awesome, but it's not the aesthetic of this world. Right. And finding our feet in that world and learning how armor works, how creatures work, all that kind of stuff. 
um, I think the biology background that I that I had, and and mm -hmm. my my colleague Ben Wooten, who was another of the designers on the projects, he actually he did more than I did. He actually finished his biology degree, so he was <laughs> very well versed in all that sort of thing. Uh, and Jamie Best Warwick, one of our sculptors, Mike Asquith, another of our sculptors. These guys all had a profound understanding of anatomy and uh, and you know how animals work and that kind of stuff. So they were able, in the same way that we were able to bring an academic understanding of armor and weaponry to our designs. Those guys were mm -hmm. also able to apply an understanding of, of um, physiology. Mm -hmm. So even when we're designing fantastical creatures, there's, an, there's enough reality in there that you can accept it and that when it moves, it kind of looks like it could work. You know, it looks yeah. like the hellbeast could fly because it wins are kind of reasonably big, probably not yeah. realistically big enough to, to, to hold it up, but at least a step in that direction right. big enough. They don't look like a bumblebee flying around. Right. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, at, um, that 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 philosophy pervaded the whole the whole project, mm -hmm. but yeah, the beginning was tough trying to find out what the parameters were. How crazy can we go? Um, how safe do we need to be? Where can we be brave? Where can we, yeah, play with it? <clears throat> and yeah. so the first things that we designed were the urukai, um, and I think and the cave troll was the first creature. The urukai armor and um, elven armor. Okay, uh, and yeah. once we sort of found the groundwork, okay, that's what the good guy's stuff looks like. That's what the bad guy's stuff looks like. It's, it's now built out from here. Then it became easier, yeah. I think. So but um, I, I look okay. back, because this is the other thing. Because I was pretty new, mm -hmm. uh, like I look at the artwork, I look back sometimes at the artwork that we were doing 25 years ago, and uh, and I'm like... <laughs> I wouldn't hire those guys. <laughs> like, I'm like, I'd hire Ellen Lee and John Howe, but those guys didn't know anything. <laughs> Look at those drawings. I'm like, oh, man, that's such a bad drawing. I can't believe I did that. <laughs> but what those drawings were were steps in the process, and mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if they were bad drawings because the outcome we got to in the end was right. good because we yeah. had good input from people around us, and we learned as we went along. So, so while I'm not enormously proud of some of the drawings I did back then, I, I do think that somehow through the process we found the ideas that mattered. And, mm -hmm. and because we're working with amazingly talented craftspeople, amazing leather workers and armor makers and, and creature creators and that sort of stuff, the, the work at every stage rose and got better mm -hmm. and better and better. So you might do a crappy drawing, but it's got a good idea in there, but you hand it off to somebody who turns it into something that is a true work of art yeah. and then it ends up on screen. So no, so no one thing was ever one person's own project at all. Everybody contributed and it got stronger and stronger as it went along. That was amazing and gratifying, um, and I'm so thankful for that because if it looked exactly what I drew, oh. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm curious. You you mentioned earlier that um, before they they were originally going to make King Kong back in '95, um, the Weta team was really small. Mm -hmm. um, so what what was the the number of employees there when uh, when you kind of started there to to go you know for king kong that fell through and then compare that to today what is it up to today so we were all contractors so the the, the size of the company varied a little bit depending on what the work was but um when i started there though i think there was between a dozen and 20 people okay. uh, at where workshop now our sister company where the digital who do all the digital effects they're actually a separate company um uh, on very good terms of course and we actually mm -hmm. share a name but there are a separate company with their own management structure and everything they were a little bit larger um and of course they grew to to be very very large through the lord of the rings and you know they were in the thousands sort of thing yeah. and they even you know uh, have since become bigger on projects as well right. but at the workshop yeah we were like a dozen 20 people and we we had to increase i think we ended up with um somewhere between 150 and, and 200 people in the workshop itself and then and then dozens perhaps even 100 more actually yeah. out on set managing the stuff that you know we would make the stuff and then we'd ship it to those guys they'd take it out to the set and, and on location and, and be yeah. using it out there as well so so it the, the company grew very very quickly uh, yeah. and it's great a testament to Richard uh, Taylor and Tanya Roger who you know is, uh, created the company um, and managed it through that time that they were able to keep uh, keep it all, you know, working. And actually <laughs> yeah. they'd never done anything on this scale before. Nobody yeah. in, our, in our experience had, you know, this is, this is a, a, akin to doing a Star Wars movie. Right. But nobody here in New Zealand had ever done a, a Star Wars movie. Right. Uh, so, you know, we, as I say, we didn't know what we didn't know. 
Um, and and everybody was so young. Like as I say, our design team, most of us were in our early twenties. We had a, mm -hmm. maybe a couple of guys who were closer to thirty, or maybe just over thirty. Thank goodness we had Alan Lee and John Howe with some experience there to help guide us. Um, and but like Richard and Tanya were, I think on Lord of the Rings, they must have been like 31, 32, and oh, they're wow. running this yeah. massive thing. Um, pretty extraordinary. Uh, yeah. I'm still amazed that, that it all came out the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and with enormous pressure, this is the other thing about the Richard and Tanya running Weta is the enormous pressures they were under from the studios back in the States who were obviously spending big money. And were like, well, who are these guys down in New Zealand, middle and we've never heard of this company before. And we're giving them money and trusting they're going to come with a, you know, uh, deliver us an nice astronaut. They obviously were looking very, very closely. You know, you had your, your Harvey Weinstein's, um, you know, mm -hmm. looking over your shoulder. Uh, yeah. That's pretty scary stuff. We all, you know, stuff certainly come out about what the kind of guy he was. Um, right. And yeah. that was, we certainly experienced a little bit of that at where, yeah. where to, you know, the, um, him, uh, that, that mob-like mentality mm -hmm. that, that sort of pervaded there. Um, but thankfully, that's not the kind of person that Peter Jackson is. It's not the kind of person yeah. that, that, that Richard Taylor is, you know, and, and, uh, and once the projects really got going and we ended up working with New Line too, just we had nothing but good experiences. But I think in the beginning, that pressure must have been immense, you know, mm -hmm. on the company and on Richard and Tanya. And they shielded the rest of us from that. So all we had to worry about was how cool can this elf look yeah. and not am I going to lose my company tomorrow because I've got this massive studio entity looming over me, you know, right. watching everything I do ready to pounce if they think we're doing anything wrong. So, yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, so I, I absolutely love asking this question uh, to people involved. I I think uh, one of the most humorous ones I've had so far is John Rhys Davies. So the, the question oh, is, really? um, at what point did you realize Lord of the Rings was something special? And mm -hmm. uh, John told the story of how he kind of wasn't feeling the idea of being down in New Zealand for such a long time. And so he was all prepared to like go down and you know, just say, ah, this isn't going to work. And then he walked around Weta Workshop and um, just kind of cursed to himself, like, you know, I just walked in <laughs> and everyone is making the most incredible stuff in every single department. And he just absolutely could not say no at that point. Like he wow. knew that there was something. And like he even talked about a, a press conference where he said that it was going to be bigger than Star, the new Star Wars, which was wow. the prequels at that time. And, uh, I guess I guess uh, ca caused Peter a little bit of stress making such a bold claim that early, but uh, yeah, but he was right. He was but friends with George Lucas, right? So yeah. <laughs> so wow. um, so yeah. What at, so for you? At what point you know did you? I mean, obviously, being a Tolkien fan, you like you said, you're constantly pinching yourself like this is the most incredible experience. Um, but at what point did you? Um, in the production process, just say, okay, we've we've got something here. This could be, you know, huge. Mm. I think, I mean, obviously, as you say, as a fan, there's always the hope mm -hmm. that this is going to be something special, but there's no real reason to expect that it will be because right. movies get made all the time and, <clears throat> you know, we, we go see a movie, even those of us in the film industry go see a movie and enjoy it and go, oh, that was, that was really fun. You know, um, I'm hungry. Should we go get burgers yeah. or something? You know, and... T 10 minutes later you've forgotten about forgotten it, it yeah. so, uh, and there are very few movies that really stick with you that you're still talking about years later mm -hmm. uh, and there's the hope that the lord of the rings would be that because the subject matter really demands that it should be yeah um but ultimately we were just trying to do our best uh and and you know at the end there's so much within the roles that we each have there's so much you can't control you can only control mm -hmm. what you are doing and you hand it off and then that's you know it becomes the, somebody else's responsibility and and you know you can heart heartache about it like oh my mm -hmm. goodness how's this going to work out but ultimately you can't control it so you have to let yeah. that go um so it's a rare privilege i think um and especially given it was like that my first big movie experience right. to actually yeah. work on something that that actually is special and as you go along you realize oh, wow, actually, this is going to be something pretty cool. I think, as I said, we all hoped it would be, mm -hmm. but but I didn't have reason to think that it would be something that was really going to catch um, mm -hmm. until we saw the first uh, the first cut-together footage with mm -hmm. a temp score at the time. But um, 
my memory's a little hazy now because oh my god it's 20 years ago right, <laughs> but yeah more than that now but but peter screened in our winter cinema peter would put a little screening on of some material that he was taking overseas to show uh, i guess mm -hmm. to investors and to you know the studios and and to cinema owners and that kind of stuff um and it was a few scenes from the first part of the story so i think we had a little bit of hobbiton mm -hmm. meeting frodo and bilbo and we had a little bit of the characters on their journey um i think there was a bit of rivendell there was there was the stuff of um, the fellowship going out, uh, hiking up into the mountains, and mm -hmm. and Frodo drops the ring, and uh, you know, and 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 Boromir picks it up, yeah. which I remember seeing that the first time as a fan. I'm like, whoa, that's not in the book. <laughs> I don't know about this. Um, and then we had a bit, a little bit of Moria, and we had mm -hmm. the, we had. I'm pretty sure we had some of of uh, yeah, we had a bit of Moria stuff, Battle and Balan's tomb, and then we had a, a chunk of Amon Hen, including. Boromir's death scene cut together mm. with at the time the temp score was I think it was music from Braveheart or something like that yeah and it was only about 20 minutes of footage and as I say I'm going in kind of guarded going mm, they're going to change some stuff from the books I don't know about this <laughs> you know um and then by the end of it like everybody's we're all freaking crying man we, we're like we met Sean Bean two minutes ago uh yeah. climbing up uh, you know, it, we knew it as Boromir two minutes ago climbing up Caradhras and he picks up the ring and two minutes later we're watching him die and Aragorn's, yeah. you know, standing around that kind of stuff. And we're just, and everybody's devastated. And that was the moment I went, holy smokes, Peter's got something here. Yeah. He's captured the emotion. And yes, there are changes. There's stuff that's not like the books, but the spirit somehow of it mm -hmm. is there, even when the details aren't. And yeah. more than that, he's made he's reached out and he's made it he's taken these these characters and made an emotional connection with us as an audience and within you know i was invested so so that's the point i was like oh, oh, oh <laughs> man hold on we are we are a ride folks you know yeah. this is, this is going to be cool and and there's reason to think that this actually might be something really really special of course later on you get someone like Howard Shaw coming on and his mm -hmm. soundtrack gets added to it and, you know, it just takes it to a whole oh my gosh, other yeah. level, right? Because there's nothing like the music just reaches in and and takes hold of your emotions and drags you with it. No matter yeah. where you, where you want to go or not, that music takes you. Um, yeah. You know, the other scene that I was worried about as a fan was uh, worried about how people were going to receive it and whether or not it would work was um, substituting Arwen in. Oh, yeah. Orphan in the books when she takes Frodo and rides with her. Now, I, I had no expectation that we were going to see Glorfiddle in the movie because mm -hmm. this elf shows up for five minutes, does a cool thing, and then leaves. <laughs> right. Never going to be in the movie. Peter's going to change that, you know, with yeah. good reason. For film, yeah. Films are different than books. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you're going to introduce a character there who has particular significance later in the story. But because they put Arwen in there, there was the worry, oh, what, are people going to kind of cynically go, oh, they're just injecting a female character because there's mm -hmm. not enough female characters in it. And there aren't. You're right. It's a book that was written at a different time. Yeah. So so obviously Peter and Fran and Philip, they were very thoughtful about where they introduced characters and tried to, you know, increase the, the diverse representation in that in that film without doing anything that felt completely alien to the, to the mm -hmm. script. But, but, but this, so I'm all for it. Like, I'm, yes, great, more Arwen, let's do that. But yeah. I was worried, are we turning Arwen to an action hero? Is that yeah. true to the spirit of Tolkien? But I'm in the cinema watching that scene where she takes Frodo and she jumps on the horse and rides and, and the music swells and the race are behind her. And I'm like, and I'm, and again, because I'm, I blub easily. I'm, <laughs> I'm crying watching, like, oh, I love this so much. And like, so again, those are the moments of like, okay, I'm a believer, you've got me. I'm hooked. I'm working on this, but I'm also your biggest fan. Right. So, and I think I really, again, I feel very, very grateful to get to work on something that I can actually watch as a fan and not have the fact that I worked on it interfere with my ability mm -hmm. to enjoy it as, as just nerding out watching it. Yeah. So, uh, so I show those films to anybody who will sit down for that length of time and watch them. I, I forced my kids to watch them many times. You know, <laughs> my, my family, I took, I dragged my grandmother to them and said, do you have to watch this film? And, you know, and, and she's hiding her eyes every time the orcs are on screen. But then she's, you know, <laughs> the moments where Gandalf is riding out and shining his staff, you know, and, and saving Faramir and his, and, uh, from the Nazgul and stuff yeah. and the ring and the, uh, the fell beast. You know, she's, she's, oh, I love this, you know. So, um, yeah, thankfully, um, it's luckily they're good enough films that, that even when a dork like me drags his family members along who aren't interested in this genre at all, right. they get them as well and they love them as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Again, I, thank you, Peter. Thank you for steering the ship so so cleverly that yeah. we 
yeah, that they landed because it could have been a disaster. Oh, it's yeah. Could have come out and it could have just stunk, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It would have been the last any of us worked in the industry. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, you know, and, and then what happens? You've already, the film studio has already invested in two other movies. So that would have been disastrous. Yeah, it was quite a, quite a gamble, really. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, there is stuff as a fan, there's stuff that doesn't quite work for me because they, they will always be the case. You know, I, um, I read the books and certain characters are represented one way. You see them in the films, they're slightly different. I'm like, oh, I would have done it differently. But for me, overall, it works. Oh, absolutely. Really, really well. So, uh, yeah, again, I, I keep saying it, but I just feel so grateful that I was there and could be a contribute to it in some small way. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I, I totally relate to dragging people to go see the films because I, I was one of those that you speak of that was introduced to this world through the films. Oh, um, really? Yeah. So I, I saw fellowship, uh, on DVD and then a couple months later, Two Towers came out in theaters. And right after seeing Two Towers, I went out and bought the books and read through them, you know, before wow. seeing Return of the King. And so Return of the King was the one I was most worried about because at that point I was all bought in and I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, I hope they stick the landing. And by golly, like you guys stuck the landing. And then from that point on, any relative or friend who was like, oh yeah, you know, I've seen the first two. Any sh- sh- any interest in seeing it? I was like, let's go, let's go to the theater right now, let's go. And I took so many <laughs> random groups of people. They're like, okay, I guess I'll go. It's like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So I'm really curious, since you said you know you're such a book nerd and that um, you had things very particular in mind. So what what's an example of one that ended up different than how you had mm-hmm. imagined it? Gosh, that's a good question. There were some. Let's try and remember what they were. I think early on, I imagined the elves as being a little bit more fey than they ended up being. So I think early on, I was pushing for a lot more uh, like um, natural fibers and stuff like that, like mm. clothes that looked like they were, you know, rough spun wool or yeah. had plant based stuff woven through them. Um, because I think that's my my aesthetic tends to run a little bit more, um, my, uh, a little bit more fantasy, maybe a little mm-hmm. bit more. Um, I think because growing up Hen- as a Henson's fan, you know, I'm, I'm a little mm-hmm. bit dark crystal, a little bit labyrinth, that kind of stuff. So yeah. I think I probably imagined uh, the first drawings of Zoom for the Elves were a little bit more woodsy, and they end up becoming a little bit less of that. There's a lot more, you know, velvet and more processed fabrics and that kind of stuff. And and, and they're a little less like uh, running through the forest and a little bit more sort of drifting through their their uh, um, their architecture. You know, it's, it's, it's mm-hmm. slightly different. So so that's probably the thing that that uh, where I had to pivot a little bit. But the one thing that that was easy was that I think everybody agreed that. Um, uh, when we were looking for real world influences for the, these imaginary cultures, that that um, natural flowing shapes, you know, things like the Art Nouveau movement, um, were good touchstones for us to use to try and establish, you know, uh, iconography that was particular to certain races, particularly the elves, mm-hmm. for example. You know, very very much grounded in that kind of thing, and that was so that so while they weren't quite as as uh, as fey or Tinkerbellish as perhaps I had already imagined, yeah. Um, it, there was not much of a transition to, to land where they, they finally did land. And, and the nice thing with the elves is because you've got multiple different groups of them, you can kind of, that becomes a scale that you can slide and move. And when we get to the Hobbit, they are a little bit more of that. The Mirkwood elves are a little bit more of that than right. perhaps the Rivendell elves and stuff, you know, might be. Um, so that's, that's what I was thinking what... in some of the, the uh, behind the scenes books that you did. I noticed some of the, you know, looking through the concept art, there was a, a lot more of a, um, that woodsy feel to the Merkwood mm. elves in The Hobbit. And, and that's partly also because, and I'm sure this is a reason we'll get to talk about more later on, but that, you know, the aesthetic of The Hobbit is a little bit different too, to mm-hmm. Lord of the Rings, um, partly because of, I guess, uh, the difference in Peter as a filmmaker by that point, and also just the nature of the book is a little bit different too. Mm-hmm. So that we, we, we gave ourselves license to be a little bit more, um, a little bit less hyper realistic in that one than perhaps we were a little less grounded than we were in the Lord of the Rings. It's a wee right. bit more whimsical. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so the elves in some way, yeah, uh, were, I suppose, uh, I suppose that for me. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, but, you know, they worked out cool. So I don't, oh, I'm absolutely. Not, 
I'm happy with the way they turned out. <laughs> they weren't how I first imagined, but they, they look cool. Yeah. Um, so we, we talked a little bit about, you know, kind of the, the challenges you faced early on in, uh, you know, uh, designing. So what, at, at the end of the day, what looking back is your favorite of, uh, you know, whether it's creature character, the, um, of your design work on, um, really any of the films, um, Lord of the Rings or the Hobbit, what's, what's the one you point to and say like, Oh, I just love this piece. Hands down the ends. That was mm -hmm. a, it, it's a tree beard for me um, because I always love those characters. Again, they're slightly more fey and whimsical than a lot of the other elements in Lord of the Rings. Um, you know, they come out of left field and everybody's kind of surprised by them. Nobody more than Saruman. Um, yeah. that they, they just show up in these walking, talking tree giants, and that's mm -hmm. bizarre. So, and I think, again, this the, 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 the Henson fan in me, you know, um, they're a little bit more Muppety than some of the other characters, you know, <laughs> so we, we could be, take a few more liberties with them. But I, I always had a really strong vision in my head reading the books of what the Ents, I thought the Ents should look like. Mm. Um, and that was one of the things that we sat down as a group and started drawing Ents. That was one of the few times we most of the time, Peter had an idea in his mind about how he wanted something to look, and mm -hmm. he would guide us. But the answer is, I have no idea. Show me something, <laughs> and, you know. Let's see if we. And and I, there was a lot of concern, you know, how how are we going to make these things look? Because if yeah. we looked at previous illustrations that have been done, a lot of the time they were just you know greenish men, green people, yeah. yeah. Twigs, twigs sticking off them, or yeah. they looked like walking celery sticks. That was yeah. the other thing that you saw sometimes in drawings. Um, uh, and none of those really excited Peter. So he was a bit worried that these were characters that were going to be quite challenging. Yeah. I drew a, a really rough drawing of Treebeard, um, as I'd imagined when I was reading the books. And Peter said, look, I mean, oh, I actually kind of like that. So, mm -hmm. so that then became a design direction for us early on with them. And then I just, I was very lucky. I just got to play and draw walking, talking tree men for, you know, for a number of weeks. Um, and that was probably the most fun time on the project. <laughs> It was just, you know, drawing these cool, weird, little wee bearded characters and basing them all on different types of trees. Uh, that was yeah. tremendously fun. So then, and then following that through, this tree bed we ended up making as a gigantic puppet that could interact mm -hmm. with the actors. Um, so I got to be part of that process and actually sculpted, you know, smaller study maquettes and then, you know, inv was involved in sculpting the big one. Um, that was huge fun, really, yeah. really fun. Probably, yeah, as I say, my favorite times on the project were working on that. Um, having said that, because they were that little bit more whimsical and weird and muppety looking, mm -hmm. you know, there were a lot of people looking at them going, mm, don't know. Yeah. <laughs> is this, is this going to work? And, and you know, the puppet looked cool, but, but like, um, thank goodness the folks at our sister company, Weird Digital, um, did an amazing job of then taking these rather whimsical characters and making them move mm -hmm. and, and getting them to work and putting them in a scene believably so you could actually honestly look at them and go, oh, yeah, that character's there and it's not yeah. just a, a special effect. Uh, and then, of course, John Reese davies beautiful, you know, vocal performance as Treebeard. Yeah. Um, Right up to the last moment, there was the worry, oh, my God, is this actually just going to be, are these guys just going to get laughed off the screen right. or don't will they work? And it's and, you know, doubly difficult because of the way Tolkien writes them in, the, in the, his, his books. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're kind of weird and they kind of overstay their welcome a little bit. <laughs> like they just, they really slow to talk mm -hmm. and take a long time to make a point. I'm like, that's not usually good in cinema. Right. Yeah, John um, Rhys Davies actually made the same point when we talked oh, really? about Treebeard a little bit. Yeah, he said, you know, how he has these really long pauses and everything's really drawn out. And if you actually, tr you know, truly adapted that, people would get bored out of their minds because it would take way too long. Yeah, but somehow, you know, again, it comes down to the writing. Mm -hmm. Um Trusting the source material, which is something I hear Philippa uh, Boyens, one of the writers on the project, talking a lot about is trusting Tolkien and, yeah. you know, just doing stuff because that's the way he wrote it. And he's a, he was a clever guy. Um, and and then, as I say, Peter's direction, uh, all the other elements that came to, to, to bear on it, and especially the work that the folks at Weta Digital did, the animators, yeah. you know, the, the creature builders, who, you know, we, I could draw something, I could sculpt something, but those guys made it move, made it real. And right up to the last minute, I was worried, is this going to work? And then when you see that character walk on screen, you see him squish the walk and, and, and they start some of the conversations oh, yeah. with Miriam Pippa, and you're like, oh, thank God. It worked. It's yeah. okay. 
<laughs> yeah, so that was both my, my greatest joy on the films, but also mm -hmm. probably one of my biggest anxieties. Because yeah. if it didn't work, everybody's going to like, well, who drew that? Who was yeah. the idiot that thought that was a good idea? <laughs> yeah, so, lucky. <laughs> yeah, it all worked out. Yeah, they look absolutely fantastic. I think, you know, there's a lot of people who, uh, you know, Treebeard is one of, if not their favorite character. He is for me, man, because he's yeah. like he speaks for the trees, you know. He's the yeah. he's the Lorax of uh, <laughs> of, of um of those movies. But, he yeah. brings about he brings a, he gives a voice to uh, an entity that doesn't have a voice, which is nature, mm -hmm. and I I love that. Um, so and, and it's so powerful those moments in the book, and then again in the film, man, I'm I'm jumping up and down on my seat at the cinema yeah. when I watch that, uh, that 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 when the ants storm Isengard and oh yeah. Started. And again, you've got Howard Shaw's music just, mm -hmm. just soaring. It's, the March of the Ants. Oh my gosh. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> I want more ants. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, obviously through, through your work with, uh, you know, the behind the scenes books, we've gotten to see a lot of uh, concept art um, from the films, from uh, especially, you know, the, the Chronicles books, the, the Hobbit Chronicles books, um, which are amazing. The set of, uh, six, um, are there, are there any, um, and I don't know how much of this you would have seen, but are, are there, you know, things that were filmed or, you know, whether deleted scenes, unreleased things, um, that you've seen that you would just love for the world to see. I know with the most recent 4k set that came out, they, finally included the the can film reel which oh, had a I lot did. of the footage that you were talking about um, yeah you know it, it sounded very similar so it might be the same reel i think um, it's the same thing yeah yeah so that that was the first time we had seen that and there was like alternate lines and you know a couple glimpses at shots that you know i had never seen and you know after watching all the appendices and everything i'm like getting my mind blown by you know footage is 20 years old um so is there anything that you can think of that you know, the, the, the maybe the world hasn't seen that, uh, who knows, maybe we get on a future release someday. Yeah, there's there's tons, man, because because Peter filmed so much material. Yeah. And we designed so much material. And because the films are being rewritten as we were designing, you design something and then the screen would change and, you you know, that's not in the movie anymore. Pivot. So yeah. there's, there's a huge amount of material still. Um, obviously, the, the books, um, and that's one of the purposes of those books. That's why I put my hand up to to be involved writing the the behind the scenes art books for the Hobbit. Yeah. Um, I didn't get to do them for the Lord of the Rings, but I we, we collaborated very very closely with some lovely folks at HarperCollins who did. Um, right. Chris Smith uh, was uh, worked on those, and you know wrote the Weapons and Warfare book. Mm -hmm. um, it was just 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 lovely to work with. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah. So so those books are a fantastic opportunity to see stuff that didn't make it into the movie, and also alternate ideas and to explore. I think it's one of my favorite things about concept art books is you get to see when you in the really good concept art books, you get to see the process yeah. and see where the ideas folded and evolved and moved and changed and it became what mm -hmm. we saw on screen. They don't just appear out of nowhere. They they right. they. They grow yeah. and multiple people have thought have input into it before they become what you see and i've always been fascinated in those those choices that it, why does it look that way well at mm -hmm. first it started like this mm -hmm. and it became that so so there's tons of that sort of stuff which is great um but yeah peter filmed a huge amount of material yeah. um alternate takes um scenes that then he had thoughts oh you know actually why well, that doesn't really work mm -hmm. um and there's also stuff that you know when the lord of the rings was going to be two films there were different needs from certain yeah. scenes. Certain scenes had to form different functions. They they landed in different places in the story, so they had to do different things. So, you know, like I think uh, famously we've all heard about how Arwen was going to be right. much more in the story. It was going to show up at Helm's Deep. Helm's Deep, even a few yeah. Shot, a few shots in the movie where if you're really eagle-eyed, you can spot her. But mm. um, a lot more of that shot. Um, again, I love it. That in the end, they trusted the books and yeah. and brought it and you know made the choice not to do that and bring it back to closer to what Tolkien had written, which is just, just that was the right choice. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like there's there's oh there's there are scenes that I hope you guys get to see one day. There was a whole bunch of stuff that was shot of the orcs and Moria chasing the Fellowship, and Aragorn mm. leads the Fellowship down into Lothlorien, and they meet Haldir and get taken up into the flats and given sanctuary. But there's stuff shot. There was there was footage of the orcs. Trying to get into Moria and uh, not into Moria, sorry, big part of the 
Loth Lorien. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so they're you know, they're running around in the trees, and the elves are picking them off. I mean, there's, oh. there was stuff shot of that. I hope one day you guys get to see that. Um, I don't know if this has been released or not, but there's the stuff where, for a while, there was the notion of well, we need to have Sauron show up at the Black Gate at the end, you know, right. and fight Aragorn. Which again, I'm glad that that didn't end up in the movie because it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. But I can understand from a filmmaking point of view, why there was the impetus to try and ex explore that idea because that's yeah. traditionally more of how you'd have a film work out with the hero right. fighting the big bad guy at the end. Yeah. Um, of course, in the final movie, it was a big troll that he fights, you know, mm -hmm. but at, at some point it was going to literally be some kind of version of Sauron. Yeah. Uh, and part of that was there was exploration of actually making him look um, where he puts on the, the guise of Anatar. Uh, yeah. He actually, actually looks beautiful um, mm -hmm. and... and Almost, you know, like a well, he looks like a um, a, a Maya, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a beautiful Maya spirit, which again, he shouldn't be able to do at that point in the story. So right. I'm glad that yeah. didn't happen. But it's cool stuff. Um, yeah. Have they ever released? I can't remember if they've ever shown much. There's probably some of the behind the scenes documentary footage of the original version of the Witch King and Eowyn fighting, because originally. The way it's described hmm. in the book, the Witch King shows up and he's in this, he's in armor and he has this tall helmet, um, mm -hmm. tower like helmet with a little, little narrow slit in it. Um, uh, actually, I think in the book he's described as just having the crown and there's nothing. Um, but, right. but anyway, yeah. we had him, he was, he showed up in armor and he has this big mace that he mm -hmm. fights with. And we, we made a suit of armor. We shot that stuff of him fighting. But then everybody, you know, who unless you were a film, you know, unless you were a talking dork like me, everybody goes, oh, that's Sauron. And it's like, no, that's not Sauron. It does. It's a different, he looks different than the way Sauron looked. But they're like, oh, really? So, <laughs> so Peter wisely went, no, you know, we need to make the Witch King actually look like the way people remember the Witch King looking. And so he made him look much more like the way we see the Black Riders looking where he's in the yeah. black cow. And it's just that the big war mask that goes over. Yeah. And, Instead of a mace, because Sauron carries a mace in the prologue mm -hmm. sequence, so instead of giving the, the Witch King a mace again, he's like, well, let's give him a different kind of weapon. He gives him right. this ridiculously huge flail. <laughs> yeah. um, but there's that alternate footage of the of the armor, the man in armor version of, mm. of the Witch King. Which is, it's a, it didn't work for the film, but it's a cool looking suit I of armor. It looks amazing, yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. From memory, that was, I think, Warren Mahi. Uh, and a little bit of John and Ellen working on that as well. Um, it's, a, it's a cool looking suit of armor. So I'd love for somebody to see that one day. Oh, yeah. You, you know, eventually the stuff's going to get seen. It's too valuable yeah. for it not to get seen. So someday, yeah. it wasn't that's, for the 20th. Maybe we can hold our hope for the 25th anniversary. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's what I'm I'm hoping. I tr I uh, actually just in, in jest, I, uh, well, I'd say kind of in jest, but in all i was pretty serious about it too <laughs> um i i started a uh change.org petition that was uh oh, re cool. release the mithril cut is what i like to dub it was the mithril cut where i i'm like give it all to me i want to see all the deleted scenes everything there is to see <laughs> so hopefully yes. for 25 yes. years absolutely um, and send me the url i will sign it uh oh, definitely absolutely. Um, and i want i want that stuff as well right because look i'm also a collector so i like to have that on i want oh, that, yeah. that blue -ray on my shelf uh, yeah. you know? <laughs> and then i'll have something fresh to force my kids to watch yeah so yeah, that'd be great <laughs> uh, let's yep. also just take a moment because i think it's appropriate to do so to acknowledge the behind the scenes material that yes. was put together for those films. So have you had a chance to talk to Michael Pellerin at all, who who was who basically put I'm all not. that craft of that material? No, He'd be I a haven't yet. Person for you to talk to. So Michael is one, he knows his talking like like nobody. Like the guy runs rings around around me. I consider myself a pretty deep talking dork, but but he, yeah. he knows his stuff so much even better than I certainly better than I do. Um so he's amazing to talk about from that point of view because he can talk mm -hmm. his ear off about the law. Um, but also, um, Mike was just a phenomenal documentary maker, uh, mm. phenomenal filmmaker. And, you know, we owe him, all of us as fans, uh, we owe him a great debt of gratitude for those incredible behind the scenes documentaries that are on the collector's DVD sets, you know, yeah. that like 10 to 12 hours worth of material for each film. Oh my film. gosh. Yeah. And I, uh, I honestly, I made a note because you were talking earlier about, you know, how you grew up watching behind the scenes stuff of Star right? Wars. And I made a note on here to bring that back up because... Yeah. Now I think we're we're getting to the point where you're seeing filmmakers come up who grew up watching the appendices from yes. the Lord of the Rings and I've had so many people say it's like 
watching a film school course. It's like going to film school, watching those behind the scenes features. It, it really is. It really is. I, I totally agree. So I, uh, profound thanks to, to Michael for, for, for creating that. Obviously for Peter, to Peter and also the folks at the studio for letting him share that material so freely yeah. because a lot, of, you know, a lot of the time that sort of stuff gets hoarded or doesn't. Mm -hmm. They don't like to show the unfinished product sometimes or the process. They want it all right. to just be magic. So it's awesome that that stuff is so, so available. Um, yeah, it's it's and then of course he got back got to come back and do it again on the Hobbit, which is just great as mm -hmm. well. Uh, yeah, it's, I can't tell you how many times I've been at conventions or, or met fans, uh, you know, like myself, and, and chatted with them, and they're like, "Well, actually, I've I've probably watched those appendices more than I've watched the films as well." <laughs> yeah, and, and we've got people working in the workshop who who found their way into this industry, being inspired by that material in the exact same way uh -huh. that I was inspired by that kind of material from other films in, in the, the eighties. So yeah, yeah, it's good. The cycle continues. It's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. They, I, I can't imagine, you know, I've as kind of a, a film nerd and a, um, as well as a Tolkien nerd, um, you know, I've watched so many behind the scenes footage, especially in college, I would put on movies, you know, my favorite movies, watch a bunch of the behind the scenes stuff. And, the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit uh, appendices are just on a whole nother level. I don't know if they we've... set a high bar, right? Yeah, I yeah. don't know if we've if there was anything before or will it be anything, you know, to come that that could pair, you know, be on the same level as those. Mm -hmm. Um, so I I wanted to ask since we're talking about you know behind the scenes stuff and uh, you know, um, deleted scenes, unused concepts, stuff like that. Um, one of the things that, that it's always fascinating to me to think about, um, you know, kind of in an alternate universe where Guillermo, Guillermo del Toro oh, directed yeah. the Hobbit. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, you know, is there enough stuff from that? Like, I, I, you know, I've, I talked to Richard very briefly about it, but, um, you know, was there, did you guys get far enough along in the process where there's unused material from that that maybe who knows someday we get like a Guillermo del Toro's The Hobbit you know concept art book or something oh my god you're, to you're totally singing my song now yeah um <laughs> yes the short answer is yes and the long answer because I do long answers uh is, is absolutely <laughs> now, I don't know who has to sign off on that happening mm. um when we were making the Hobbit Chronicles books we managed to get a little bit of it in there there are a few mm -hmm. things in there from the from what we called the GDT days the Guillermo del Toro mm -hmm. days on the Hobbit but most of the material in there was stuff that got reworked as Peter then um, stepped in and 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 uh, and made mm -hmm. made it his vision, um, as any filmmaker would. Yeah, uh, and as but, if if those you know people watching aren't familiar, you know Peter does explain it really well in the appendices. I believe he says, you know, I you know Peter Jackson can't make a Guillermo del Toro movie. Right. You know, so you know Peter Jackson's got to make a Peter Jackson movie. So you guys kind of, you know. Um, you know, tweak some things, obviously, but by and large, it, it was kind of a whole separate thing. Yeah, sorry, I, I just wish wanted to interject that there. The the, uh, the uh, Lord of the Rings, what if you know, uh, <laughs> the same way I do with Marvel, where we yeah. get to see Guillermo would have done. Yeah. Um, because because we worked with Guillermo for over a year on his mm -hmm. his vision for the Lord of the for a bigger pardon for the Hobbit. Yeah. Um, and there's some really cool stuff. It's very different to what mm -hmm. Peter did. Um, but it's really, really cool. So yeah, yeah, there's a phenomenal volume of material there. And also because he had other artists working on it as well. Uh, a lot of the artists that are working on Guillermo's uh, version of The Hobbit um, did not then stay and work on the mm. Peter's version. So there's there's a huge amount of work done. Mike Mignola, um, I don't know if anybody, if any of your listeners know Hellboy, uh, you'd know who Mike yeah. Mignola is. He did a bunch of work on it. Um, uh, 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 Francesco Ruiz, um, Oscar Ciccione, um, there's a whole bunch of artists uh, who, who anybody who knows Guillermo del Toro's career would mm -hmm. probably recognize him, uh, having worked on his other films. Really, really hot artists working at the top yeah. of their game who did some phenomenal work. Uh, Wayne Barlow was another one um, who was on it for a while with us. It was a great honor to get to work with those guys and meet them. Um, they did some amazing work. And then you'll also see work from, from wetter artists and from John and Alan that's totally different yeah. to the stuff you see in Peter's films. Mm. I, I don't know. I don't know who gets to sign off on whether that happens one oh, day. Man. Uh, I have no idea. But, but man, I want to see that. And, yes, oh, yeah. I, would, I would totally do the, you know, the Hobbit Chronicles uh, book, you know, addendum that has. Yeah, book seven. 
Oh man, it'd be great. And you know, while we're talking about Gilmo, I just um, I just want to say what an amazing honor it was working with him. Um, mm -hmm. You know, every director you work with is different, um, but the experience of working on the films, even though we didn't get to finish them, the experience of work on the films with with Gilmo was uh, was such a pleasure. Mm -hmm. He is such an inclusive director. Like. Um, he walked in on the first day and just said, I want to get to know you guys. I want to know all about you, your families, your life. We're going to, we're going to live together on this project. Yeah. And he said, I want all your ideas. He said, he said, there's no such thing as a bad idea. There's just an idea that hasn't found the right place to live. So he says, so bring mm. them forth. I want it all. And I'll help pass them, pass those ideas and we'll find the right ones, massage it into the right shape for our film. Um, so he was incredibly inclusive. He took us all out. Uh, I think it was like the second week that he was on the project. He took us all out. Uh, to dinner and got a bunch of folks who frightfully drunk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that was very funny, actually. But again, he's like, I want to get to know you guys. So let's see you all with your guard down. Um, mm -hmm. and, but that's the kind of, he's very gregarious, very, very giving, very generous man. Um, so yeah. I was really sad that we didn't get to finish the films with him. Uh, of course, I'm thrilled that we got to actually make Peter's vision of the Hobbit. Oh, yeah. That's one. But I'm greedy. And I, want, yeah. I would love to somehow see Guillermo's well, version as well, <laughs> just so I can have both, right? Yeah. Um, and if that can't happen, then yes, I hope that at some point maybe we can see an art book or something which has all that content in it because there's, as I say, there's vast troves of material. Yeah. Goblin Town was crazy. Oh, like, <laughs> <laughs> if you think Peter's Goblin Town was nuts, man, you got nothing on what Guillermo had in mind. He had, it, it was huge what he was going to do with that part of the films. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was nuts. There's tons of the stuff there to share. Yeah. I, I just remember, you know, when, when it was announced that he was going to direct it, I had already, you know, I was, uh, really enjoyed, uh, Pan's Labyrinth was the film that I discovered, uh, Guillermo del Toro. And then, um, of course, then I afterwards learned like, oh, he also did Hellboy and, you know, uh, it kind of grew from there, but, um, you know, because the Hobbit had such an uh, kind of an interesting with the rights issues and everything. It kind of had an interesting uh, path to finally being created. We had all this time as fans to like imagine like, oh, what's this guy going to do with Middle mm -hmm. Earth? You know, what what are the wargs going to look like? What are, you know, what's this going to look like? What's the Battle of Five Armies going to look like? And so, yeah, the, the, it, um, you know, I, I tell people that my favorite film never made is the Guillermo del Toro Hobbit because I wow. just desperately want to see it and it's kind of at this point my favorite book never written is the <laughs> behind the scenes of Guillermo del Toro's Hobbit. <laughs> I hope it can happen someday I really do you know time sometimes you know people's attitudes on things or, or concerns about things and obviously the marketing concerns about stuff change and so yeah. things that maybe couldn't happen at a particular time for whatever reason suddenly those reasons go away and somebody thinks it's a good idea later on. So yes, hoping sign me up, man. I'd, I'd love to be involved if that ever happens. Yeah. And also it'd be a lovely opportunity to reconnect with all those folks that we work yeah. with those because the Hobbit is 10 years ago now too, right? Yeah. Nearly. Uh, I think uh, yeah, next year. I so. oh, no, it's just yes, uh, 10 years for, uh, yeah. for the Hobbit. So um, it'd be nice to reconnect with those artists again and call them up and ask them to cast their minds back and, and think yeah. about this stuff. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't the first time that I or my colleagues worked with Guillermo either because he actually came down and worked with us briefly on there was going to be a Halo movie. Uh, right, at one point. yes. I mean, now it's going to be a TV show. I can't wait to see that. But, yeah. um, but Halo was going to be a movie and, and Guillermo del Toro was one of the directors attached to that mm -hmm. project for a time. The other director attached to it was Neil Blomkamp who went right. on to do District, District 9. District 9, yeah. Um, but, yeah, again, there's an art book to be made of, of yeah. Guillermo's Halo uh, someday. <laughs> yes. Maybe. Who knows? I, yeah, that's another one. So you're totally speaking my jam right now because uh, <laughs> in my college days, I, you know, played Halo. I can't even tell you how many hours I played that game in my dorm room. And when I saw, you know, Weta sharing, um, it was when you guys uh, made like a warthog, a functioning I warthog. Know. I saw a video of it driving around the parking lot down there at Weta and uh and saw you know the the blaster rifle and everything and i'm like oh my gosh these guys did it like that is exactly what it needs to look like that looks incredible oh, so it looked exactly how i would have thought it should look like now i didn't know the halo universe when we started working on that i i was aware of it but i hadn't 
delved into it in the same way they had with the Lord of the Rings or whatever. So, yeah. so in order to try and become an overnight expert, that required the only way to do that is through a lot of video gaming, right? Oh yeah, so, for sure. So I and I and my colleagues, we had a little land set up, and and you know we would be designing. And then, what, what? One o'clock is lunchtime. So yeah. instead of going outside and getting something to eat or some fresh air or some sunlight, right. like a sensible person would be, we'd just like jump on and start shooting yeah. each other on. <laughs> and Halo, I, I was shocking, and I just got owned every time. I was just <laughs> the new, but it was still fun. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> so um, you know, obviously, we talked a lot about behind the scenes stuff. I mentioned it earlier, but. You know, you obviously wrote um, mm -hmm. the six volume set Hobbit Chronicles. They're absolutely amazing behind the scenes books. Um, Thank you. you know, I, I would compare it. You know, this is kind of like the uh, the book equivalent of, you know, what you would uh, kind of get in the appendices on the DVD. Obviously, it's different material and everything. Um, specifically, I, I love, you know, this is one of the ones that I look at the most because it has um kind of backstories you know it has interviews with the actors that played the different dwarves and you get a lot of uh insight into their characters that um you don't necessarily get because i mean gosh there's 13 of them you know you can't you know have this fully fleshed out backstory for every single one of them but um there's so much you know you you uh read from jed brophy like what you know nori's backstory is and his family situation and stuff and you actually see some of these things uh in the films like if you look in the background ways, um, right yeah. yeah like yeah in small ways you know that um if i hadn't read read this i might not have picked up on it um like a good uh you know we had jed uh quite a while ago here on the channel and he talks about you know nori's kind of you know we see we see him steal stuff from rivendell obviously <laughs> and like he's kind of a shifty <laughs> character and you know, through your books, I kind of picked out some things, you know, in, even in the later films, how he's kind of like looking at the exits, like just kind of, you know, kind of a sketchy guy. Um, so, yeah, the, these books have really given me an even deeper appreciation for the Hobbit films. Um, and I feel like they really add a lot, you know, to you. to those uh, films. And uh, so uh, the big question is, you know, how did how did these books come about and how did you get uh, attached to to write these? Yeah, uh, well, thanks very much for the kind words. I really appreciate it. Um, those, I think um, on The Lord of the Rings, there was so much written about the filmmaking process and, and, and you know, there's so much has been said about it and, and we have those amazing appendices, but, but there's nothing like getting to tell your own story. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when I'm sitting in the design room with my colleagues, you know, we're in a group, we design as a group, we're talking all the time. Um, you're playing that game where you're basically going, oh, wouldn't it be cool if... And yeah. that's the question. And and so we've got years of conversation of wouldn't it be cool if? And and so what that does is it generates just thousands of ideas, mm -hmm. thousands of drawings. Uh, and, and so, and that's just the department that I was working in. So I was like, there's content there that people would be interested in reading. Yeah. Because as we talked about before, that way it gives you insight into the, the creative choices that are made for making a movie. Why does the character look that way? Mm -hmm. what, what's the reason? Why yeah. is it this and not something else? I'm interested in that sort of stuff as a film fan. I'm interested in that sort of stuff as a Tolkien fan. Um, so that's what a lot of those books were about. Mm -hmm. But then obviously you then go outside of my own little department of five or six people and, and go to the whole project and you can just apply those same questions everywhere. Every department yeah. has those same stories, you know, different stories to tell, answering them the same questions. So that's that's what those books are. And thank goodness Harper Collins were so kind that they let me do yeah. I mean, nothing about these movies is short, right? Everything's yeah. indulgent to an extreme. A sensible person would write one book per film. But HarperCollins, mm -hmm. you know, we were like, well, there's so much content. We could easily do like two books per film and still leave stuff behind. And right. they're like, okay, we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're like, yes. So as soon as my work on the designing on the films was finishing, I just rolled straight on to, well, then picked up my microphone and just started interviewing my colleagues mm -hmm. while the memories were still fresh in their minds. Well, what, yeah. what was the, the reasoning behind that choice? Why did you do it that way? And that was great because it got me out from behind my desk and got me to actually go around and, and meet lots of other people who I normally in the course of my work wouldn't directly inter interact with. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was fascinating for me. So basically I was just being a, a nerd running around asking questions. <laughs> And then write down the answers and share them with 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 others, other people who yeah. are as fascinated as I am. So, 
Um, they are very indulgent books. They're big, heavy books. They got, I think they got bigger as they went along. They got more and more pages. <laughs> so again, thank you to HarperCollins Publishers for being so kind of letting us do that. Um, and, you know, we probably could have got away with fewer than two books per film. I mean, there's actually even more because um, we were almost finished on the the behind-the-scenes books for the, for, um, the Desolation of Smaug mm -hmm. when we got the word, oh, by the way, because your book is coming out in December and the movie comes out in December mm -hmm. and the dragon is a secret. Yeah. Your books are going to have to leave the factory where it's being printed in September. They're going to start getting shipped around the world in October. They'll arrive in storehouses in November, mm -hmm. which means that's three months where information from those books can leak to the public that we don't want them to know. We don't want them right. to see the dragon. And I'm like, you can't have, <laughs> so they were like, so pull the dragon content out of the, out of the art of the desolation of smog. I'm like, Oh my God. Like his name's in the art. title. <laughs> the name of the movie. You can't have an art book about the desolation of smell when you flip through the book and there's no dragons in it, right? right? That would kill us. Yeah. So thankfully the filmmakers relented and the studio relented and they allowed us to have a few pages of dragon content at the end of the book, but not very much. Right. Um, but the concession to that was, okay, we've got all this dragon content we've had to pull out of that book. What are we going to do with it? You know, we want to get it out there. So they were like, okay, if we do it really, really quickly, if we print them in actually each different territory rather than in China and then have it shipped from there, if we actually print some books in Europe, some books in Asia, some books in the States, whatever, um, we could actually make a little tiny wee book just on the dragon. Right. And all that content that you were going to put in the other book and plus more, you mm -hmm. can put in this. Um, but the, the, the deal is you have to write it in, in six weeks and we have to get it off to the printers. You know, it basically, it goes, it goes to print the day the movie comes out and comes out like two months later in, in, in bookstores. I think it's, I think it came out in February. So that's how we, we wow. got this little book. Uh, let me grab my copy here. Yeah. It's like a, it's like a mini chronicle. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, you know, The Hobbit, uh, you know, Unleashing the Dragon. It's just yeah. basically the whole book is just Smaug. Um, so we got to have our okay, cake and eat it. We got to have our Art of the Desolation of Smaug and we got to have a dragon book as well. It's not quite as big and all-encompassing as the other ones, but it's right. kind of like a, a mini yeah, uh, a mini it's a chronicle. supplemental. Yeah, mini chronicle. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so in actual fact, it's like seven books, and then they yeah. and then they let us come back and do a bunch more work on uh, uh, the the book we call uh, Middle Earth Script of Stream, which is is kind of all yeah. about yeah, the go. world of Middle Earth. That yeah, yeah. that mo monster this there. Is... Um, I had to get help on that. The lovely uh, Kelly Rice, yeah. um, who um, is famous on the Wondering dot net, um, you know, has her own. Um, Happy Hobbits uh, YouTube mm -hmm. channel and that sort of stuff. She actually joined me to help write that just because there was so much material to try and wrestle yeah. with because it covers both trilogies. Right. Um, but yeah, so so I again I've been very very lucky and all this stuff writing the books, working on the films, and now my current role art directing the collectibles. Mm -hmm. It's all driven by the same thing, which is I love this world so much, I don't want to leave. Yeah. <laughs> how do I take so how do I how do I take one film that I worked on twenty years ago? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess it's three films, but how do I take that and then try and stretch that as far as I can into a career so that I never have to leave Middle Earth right. um, because I love it there so much. Yeah. And that's, that's what all this is. That's so as as long as there's a way to try and stay involved, I mm -hmm. I always like try. Don't always yeah. succeed, but I, but I try. Uh, and it's been a tremendous honor. Um, to be part of that world for that long and, and to keep telling those stories um, and, and to have a reason to, 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 I guess, get paid to pick up those, you know, the lost tales and, you know, the histories of Middle Earth and just and pour through them and read all this stuff and, and, and learn that stuff. It's pretty yeah. awesome. It's, it's quite a privilege. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so as a, as a book fan, you know, you, you brought up, History of Middle Earth and uh, Book of Lost Tales. Um, are there any, um, you know, uh, references or anything that come from, you know, mm. stuff from those books that that you know you see in the films or in you know uh, the collectibles work that you guys do now? You know, are there are there things as as a book nerd that you just absolutely adore that you were able to work into your work? Yes. So, so again, this is the privilege of working with such deep source material, right? Mm -hmm. um, in a film, you design things to populate the screen. Mm 
-hmm. If you design a set, it has to have set dressing in it. You know, we go to Elrond's chamber in Rivendell, for example, yeah. and you've got characters walking around and they're seeing these beautiful paintings on the wall that depict moments from Middle Earth history. And on his shelves are artifacts and books and that kind of stuff and charts mm -hmm. and maps, that sort of thing. All the things that you see on screen have to have some kind of content to them. They have to be filled mm -hmm. with something. So, you know, to quote my friend John Howe, it may as well be something meaningful rather than just yeah. gobbledygook. And thankfully, Tolkien gives you all that material. If you want yeah. to do the work and find it, you'll find answers for all that stuff, right? So yeah. what should that be in that painting? Well, it's here. This is what yeah. it should be. So yeah. now obviously you have to be slightly careful because um, of when rights we make and stuff. Rights and the yeah. There's rights, exactly. Yeah. So you can't a lot of the time directly reference stuff that's mm -hmm. from from uh, outside of the rights that you have, say from example, the Silmarillion or Unfinished Tales or whatever. Right. But but you can kind of go there in a way, mm -hmm. as long as the script doesn't doesn't reference it, as long as you're careful and you're not, you know, you're not exploiting something you don't have, have permission to use. Right. You can certainly reference it so there's some, uh, so that what you are creating has integrity. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, absolutely. Whenever we were we were designing stuff and doing stuff, you know, what is what's the inscription on the sword going to be? Mm -hmm. Research and try and find it. I mean, in this in the, the the sword inscriptions, um, our ace in the hole there was was scholar David Salo. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance ever to talk to him. He's a great person to talk to. But David yeah. was our um, on the films on the Lord of the Rings movies. He was our go to guy. I never met him in person. I still haven't. But we would communicate by fax at the time it was because. <laughs> Email was this newfangled thing that yeah. most of us had access to. <laughs> so we would fax questions to him. You know, he's a he's basically a linguistic expert and law mm. expert on Middle Earth. And so he was our guide for if we had a really deep question about what something should be or we had a translation request, yeah. we, would, we would go to him. And he was he got it. You know, he understood the spirit of what we were trying to do. And so, you know, for example, um Arwen's sword. Um, yes. I was gonna bring uh, that up. That's so funny that you yeah, bring it up. Arwen doesn't have a sword in the books. We don't right. you know, we don't know about that. But but she has a sword in the movies um and so you know the question to david was what can we do that's meaningful that feels true to the spirit of tolkien for her sword we want to put an inscription on it what should it be and it was david that suggested the name which he found from uh, i actually don't know where exactly he pulled that particular name had a thing but he pulled that from tolkien's writings and said here's a name for a sword that tolkien never gave never found a home for but it's a cool name yeah. Um, and then what should the inscription be? And he came up with this wonderful word play on it where it actually references Arwen by name, even though it's not specifically for her as a person. It's, and, oh. and, and he was the one that came up with the notion, well, maybe this sword belonged to her. Uh, I think it's, it was Idril was what her great grandmother. Great grandmother, yeah. Gondolin from the Silmarillion. Yeah. So there are little references like that in it. Um, yeah. That you can kind of get away with without without crossing into territory where you're not supposed to go. But yeah. so we tried to do stuff like that wherever we could. You know, if there's got to yeah. be something there, let's make it something meaningful. The text demands it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, yeah. you know, the first experience of that was I think. Um, in Moria, we would we were we were the miniatures crew at Weta Workshop were making parts of Moria that we were going to see, and I remember that um, a few of them got hold of some Tolkien uh, script and they wrote and they wrote their names on mm -hmm. on you know the walls in Moria, and and somebody I can't remember who heard about it, somebody's like that's no you can't do that <laughs> yes there should be writing on the walls yeah. but no it can't it can't be the names of the model makers it yeah. has to be. The lineage of Durin, you know, it yeah. has to be something that makes sense. And so from that point onwards, and we were like, yeah, absolutely, of course. Mm -hmm. So from that point on, everything that we did had a reason for being mm -hmm. there. Even if you knew that the audience would never see it, you know, right. it's just, well, we'll see it, we'll know it's there. It, it should be something meaningful. So, yeah. yeah. And the answers are all there in Tolkien's books if you want to go looking for them, which is great. And luckily we had the time and the, uh, the um, permission to go and do that. Yeah. That's, uh, it's funny, it's so funny that you bring up uh, Arwen, uh, Arwen's sword because that was the immediate example that I was gonna bring up <laughs> as soon as you got done talking. Um, Good example. Yeah, that's a great one um, because that I- That was designed by um, Warren Mahi, was one of my colleagues and actually my best man when I got married. Um, oh, yeah, he cool. designed that and did a, I thought he did a beautiful job. It's one of my yeah. favorite props of the films. It's such a beautiful sword. And of course the nice thing about it is, okay, yes, let's say it was designed for Arwen, but mm -hmm. we quickly realized that this sword, if it's, if it's a family heirloom, there's no reason why we can't see it in the hands of other characters. So it was the perfect sword for Elrond to use yeah. In, in the in the, the second age as well. Yeah. So so again there's just this this depth and, and reality. The films. 
Yeah, so yeah, yeah, exactly. That's right. You get to see it more. And we didn't even know at the time that that was going to be right. the case. We designed yeah. it for the Lord of the Rings, but it was a perfect fit. And the lovely thing about the design of that sword is it's designed to be a lightweight sword. It's slightly mm -hmm. shorter than a lot of the other swords are um, because, um, uh, and it's designed to be wielded either two-handed by somebody who needs to, to hold it two-handed. So it has a slightly blunt area at the beginning of the blade where you can, where the, the, the handle is, is big enough for one hand, but you can put a second handle on a slightly blunt area at the beginning of the blade. It's got a little mm. kickback to stop you from, from cutting yourself. Yeah. Um, or it can be held one-handed by somebody who's very strong, has a very strong wrist, which in this case is, is Hugo Weaving's Elrond. Yeah. So Arwen can hold it two-handed and Elrond can hold it with it one-handed. Yeah. Stuff like that. It's really, really fun. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, our, Elrond is one of those characters that, you know, we don't, in the films, we don't get to explore much of his story, obviously, because so much of his story happens before the events of of these books. But as I've, you know, fully, uh, fully gone, you know, gone full nerd on uh, Tolkien, his his backstory and his connections to Numenor and everything, his brother and his wife, and like his story is just so compelling to me. So he's one of my absolute favorite characters. And um, then when I saw, you know, uh, in the behind the scenes material or read uh, that, you know, um, that it was Idril's sword. I was like, oh my God, that makes, that's so perfect because, you know, obviously, uh, you know, uh, um, there's heirlooms that Elros, the founder, you know, his brother and founder of Numenor, you know, gets, and it makes sense that, okay, well, Elrond would have Idril's sword. Like it, it's so perfect. And I, I have to say like the, um, one of my favorite shots from the entire Hobbit trilogy is when Hugo Weaving pulls out that sword, you know, to go fight the ring rates and like the camera movement is just so like, he just looks so BA in that moment. I'm like, <laughs> Oh my gosh, this is so perfect. Yeah, yeah. He's all, all armored up and everything. I'm like, this is, <laughs> this is fantastic. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's great. It's so cool that that content exists that we can delve into, um, and pull from. Uh, and and you know the, the lovely thing, of course, all that all that stuff that you allude to with Elrond and his history and his brother Elros and 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 then Numen the connection to Numenor is great because if you know that stuff, it adds so much more depth to then Elrond's relationship with Aragorn that we mm -hmm. see. Um, yeah. And there's just all the subtext there. So again, this is one of these things that you know you read the books or you see the films and you 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 get oh yeah okay Elrond's kind of a little bit like a surrogate father to, to, mm -hmm. uh, to Aragorn. But then if you want to go deeper. Yeah. You just keep going and there's so yeah. much of the stuff down there. You can just keep reading and, and keep learning and it just adds yeah. more and more layers of depth to it. It's uh, right. it's, it just keeps giving. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing. You know, you, you think about, you know, yeah, El Elrond was a, you know, a surrogate father to Aragorn as well as, you know, all of Aragorn's fathers going back for, yeah, for yeah, centuries, right. you know, and yep. he's descended from, uh, from Elrond's brother. And, um, you know, uh, obviously we, we, um, you know, the elephant in the room right now is the Amazon series that mm -hmm. takes place in the second age. And, you know, we're, we're bringing up Elrond from his early days and his brother Elros. And, you know, um, we're, we're about to go there through this Amazon series. So as a book nerd, you know, um, what are, what are your thoughts looking ahead to this show that, you know, we're now, uh, less than eight months out from the premiere date? That's nuts, isn't it? Wow, because yeah. it's been, it's, it seemed like this thing that's been hovering, waiting to drop for so yeah. long. Um, yeah, I, look, the storytelling potential, you know, is so huge for all the reasons you've just said. Um, the chance to go in and go deeper with these characters to really understood, to understand the history of the rings and what they mean and and Sauron and all this other stuff and to spend more time. I'm, I'm just always up for spending more time in that world. So, yeah, yeah as a fan, I can't wait. I can't wait. I just, you know, it, I'm in that same position that we all were when Lord of the Rings came out. Is like, oh God, I hope they do it justice, right? Yeah. We're here yeah. again. Here we are again, biting yeah. our nails down <laughs> the quick, waiting, you know, and hopefully we'll be having the same conversation in 20 years' time. Like, oh, thank God it was great, and whatever, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. You, you hope. Yeah. But so, look, so even, you... even, even if it isn't, somebody else will do it eventually. Oh, you know? yeah. I think these things are some, when you've got such great material to work from, I think at some point 
if it's possible, it becomes inevitable that it will at some point. So yeah, we live, I mean, we're so lucky. We live in an incredible age as far as media goes and streaming services and that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's like there's, there's so many, many opportunities to bring this material to life. Yeah. I mean, because you've got not only the Amazon series, but then you've also got the War of the Rahiram animated mm -hmm. film coming yeah. out. You know, I'm really pumped for that one. Yeah. So, uh, and we know that's just the beginning, right? You know, oh, yeah. these the, the hope. So, what kind of will we be sitting talking about the Cimmerillion in ten years' time? Maybe. Uh, part of me really hopes so. <laughs> yeah. I'm. Yeah. Oh my gosh. There's so many. So many events from uh, the first age as I've done videos on the channel from uh, things from right. the first age. I, I get comments all the time like, I want to see this as a movie. <laughs> I'm like, so do I. That would be me amazing. Too, man, give me armies of Belrogs. Give me dragons oh assaulting gosh. Gondolin, you know, give me, yeah. you know, godlike elven warriors. Give me the Valar, you know, laying yeah. waste to, to, to uh, just. That yeah. stuff is so epic. And now I feel like the technology is there that you could really do this stuff justice. It's yeah. a, uh, so it's okay. But obviously, as we know at the moment anyway, the Silmarillion rights are, are right. pretty well protected. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I have to say, as much as I'm dying to see that stuff on screen, I'm also, I really love that, that Christopher Tolkien in particular has, has protected that IP yeah. mm -hmm. so well because it yeah. could be, it could be exploited horribly. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you just got to hope that it hasn't happened yet. And that's because somehow fate is, is keeping it that way so that when it does happen, it lives up to what we all hope for. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's the only way I can look at it. Yeah. I mean, if I get to work on it, I'll be thrilled. If I don't get to work on it, I just get to be an audience member. Well, that's fun as well. Right. Um, I'll be there shouting in the audience and throwing popcorn <laughs> along with everybody else. <laughs> so, uh, is what's what would be your um you know if you could pick something from you know whether it's the second age when uh when the amazon series is gonna take place or you know first age we have all those uh epic battles and characters from the first age um what wh if you had to pick one storyline or one you know battle or uh one aspect from that we haven't seen adapted what what would it be I'm going to be greedy. I'm not going to pick one. I'm going to pick loads. Um, I, 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 in my mind's eye, I can see the Silmarillion as a series of films, right? Yeah. And, and, and I can see, you know, uh, that are connected in the same way that the Marvel Cinematic Universe connects, but also stand on their own as beautiful works of art. Yeah. And I can see, you know, there's a film in, in the tale of Beren and Luthien. Mm -hmm. God. Easy. Uh, as yeah. much as I love the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, I actually yeah. think, I think, those those stories make me cry and connect with me in a way that I think is even even more powerful. So I I, I want to see that someday. Yeah. I mean the tragedy of you know, the, of, of um, Turin and mm -hmm. and the, the children of Turin. Wow, yeah. wouldn't that yeah. be powerful cinema? Oh my gosh! Um, you know, uh, Tuor's journey. You know, and then and then and then return to Gondolin, and then the fall of Gondolin. Ah, yeah. <laughs> wow. You know, that's that stuff is so epic yeah incredible see that's what yeah. one day. those are all great answers <laughs> if it doesn't happen i can just live in my imagination but man i hope i hope one day it would happen oh my gosh yeah i always think you know one of my uh favorite experiences in tolkien is listening to the children of Hurin uh audiobook by christopher lee yes he does an absolutely amazing <laughs> job and Nuts. you because you get at the beginning you get you know, this exchange between Morgoth and Hurin, his father, uh, Turin's father. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like if they made this into a film, you would get Morgoth on screen for the first time. And you would have, uh, you know, one of my other favorite villains, Glaurung the dragon, mm. um, which is a totally different kind of dragon than Smaug, you know, uh, mm. just this this malice like you've never seen before. And oh my gosh, I would, I, would love for you guys to tackle that someday. That would be. Oh man, I just hope somebody cynical. tackles it one day. Yeah, yeah, or anybody. Yeah. Of confidence, but I just want to. Yeah, I get. I mean, chills when you're you're talking about it because I can imagine it. It's so clearly in my head as well. It would oh be gosh. amazing to see. Yeah, yeah. yeah Glower on the manipulator. It's just, I yeah. I mean, these stories are hard to tell because they're tragedies. But you know, mm -hmm. there are ways to do that. It's um, yeah, yeah. And it makes, you know, it makes the the happy ending of Return of the King all the the sweeter, you know, it's kind of the the climax of the whole thing. Um, 
But yeah, they yeah, they do yeah. tend to have a bit of a downer <laughs> aspect of them. You know, there's not not a lot What's of things funny? that. It's funny as, as 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 fans and as audience members that we are sometimes drawn to these tragic stories. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, as a Star Wars fan, I know when I talk with my friends who are also Star Wars fans, yeah. Revenge of the Sith is like one of is almost everybody's oh, yeah. you know one of the one of the favorites. Yeah, that's a downer of a film, man. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> that, that ends so dark with just this little thread of hope that we know pays off, but yeah. but like it's not a happy watch. No, um, but yet. We kind of love that stuff, right? Yeah. You know, and and it's weird how my favorite stories in the Silmarillion are all the are the <laughs> ones the that downers, end really yeah. badly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When I tell people, What's you know, I, I recommend Children of Horror and all the time. I'm like, it it might legitimately be my favorite Tolkien book, yeah. and I have to add the disclaimer, like it's not a happy story. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really good, but it's not happy. <laughs> um, and yeah, and your I mean, your recommendation of Christopher Lee's audiobook version is great too. Uh, I'll see you. I'll see you. Your Children of Hurin, and I'll raise you um, Martin Shaw's um, mm. uh, Silmarillion too. Is yeah. just so so good. I've listened to that thing so many times. That's I listened to that's it while how I, I first got stuff. through. That's how I was first able to get through the Silmarillion was listening to the audiobook while reading it because I just was getting buried under all the the names it's, and everything it's heavy it's heavy yeah. lifting um but but you know it's it's work worth doing <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh, you mentioned earlier obviously you know your um your title and your duties there at weta kind of have shifted over the years and right now you're um the uh collectibles art director um, so one of the cool things about Weta is, you know, like you said, you guys have never really left Middle Earth, even though the, you know, Lord of the Rings was 20 years ago, Hobbits 10 years ago now. Um, so tell, tell us about, um, you know, how, how that came to be where, you know, now you're um, uh, in this leadership position over the collectibles. Mm -hmm. Sure. No, it's, uh, again, it's a, a tremendous honor to, to be able to do this stuff. Um, one of the things I think that that is great about Weta Workshop, um, and it stems from the from when we were a small company of only a dozen people, mm -hmm. in a in a country of only like five million, you have to have a certain flexibility to be able to do a few different things because if you specialize too much in just one thing, you're going to run out of work at some point, right? Mm -hmm. You know, films like Lord of the Rings don't come along every all the time. Right. Um, when we're working on the Lord of the Rings movies. We had assembled this amazing crew of people, and and Richard, you know, my boss wanted to try and keep that team together as much as was possible. It's not always yeah. possible. He tried as much as possible, and so he was trying to find work to feed the team, as opposed to finding a team member to do team members to do the work. Um, and part of the way that he was able to do that and to carry us through the times when there wasn't film work was to find other creative endeavors to, for us to work on that weren't necessarily movie making. Yeah. Um, and one of those was making collectibles. So, you know, and his attitude was as a collector himself, he's like, well, I have all these beautiful statues and stuff on my shelf from other from properties that I love. Yeah. Um, what typically happens is, you know, filmmakers make a movie. Uh, a toy maker or a collectibles company buys a license and they make replicas of that stuff and you know if you're lucky it looks something like what you got from the movie right and now fortunately today with the digital pipelines it's accuracy is easier to achieve but it wasn't always possible it was just depending on what photographs you had to work from but he's like but imagine what we could do if we actually made the collectibles ourselves we actually had the yeah. same guy who made aragorn's sword same guy who forged Undural, can make a miniature version of it you know yeah that would be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Right. And so, yeah. and luckily, the studio saw that they they supported us in that, and so we were able to take a license um, beyond the film work to also mm -hmm. do this because we were just third party contractors on the film. Where the special effects company contracted to do a bit of design work and make some stuff, um, but they luckily let us stay with the project um, as a company, and then us as individuals stay with it. Um, making these collectibles and so it's been 20 years at first we were in partnership with sideshow collectibles um mm -hmm. later on um sideshow and weta went separate ways and we both still have lord of the rings licenses but we now produce a slightly different product yeah um so yeah so it's a way that i've been able to stay in middle earth and keep keep uh getting paid to to think about <laughs> is to to be involved in the collectibles and as a as a collector myself yeah uh that's an easy fit because i like mm -hmm. making cool stuff to put on cool. my shelf yeah my, my lovely wife doesn't always love it so much. But, but <laughs> up with, with the word junk is used, which I think is really 
It's harsh. It's harsh and un- unreasonable. Yeah, I get <laughs> I get the word like, toys a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Collectibles, right? It's it's yeah. it's acceptable art. But anyway, um I'm looking across the room. I'm yeah, catching her eye across the room. Anyway, <laughs> um <laughs> so, there are negotiations there that happen sometimes on right. acquisitions. Uh, and then sometimes there's no negotiation. I just find myself in trouble. Uh, yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> um that threw me totally. Where we? Go? Oh yeah, we're talking about collectibles. Okay, yeah. so so yeah, so so really, what I what I do is at work is I'm part of the team that helps figure out one, what are we going to make? So we come up with ideas for what we're going to make, and that goes to a business uh, team that involves Richard Taylor as well because he's passionate about the stuff, and they help decide what it is we're going to make in a given year, and then I I get to help come up with the ideas for the for the poses for those characters. You know, what haven't we made yet, or what have we made that from the movies that deserves another go? You know, Gandalf yeah. comes up again and again and again but you know particularly now that we're in an anniversary is what are the characters or things from those films that we could make replicas of that that other fans like us would enjoy having copies of um and then you know yeah what are the poses what are the creative choices we make so so that's been really really fun uh and because obviously we also have the actual costumes and armor and weapons to to source from Mm -hmm. Most of the time, not always, but most of the time we have access to stuff we can we can actually then make it really really accurate um Or again, very much like like the way Peter approached the films. If in some cases the details differ, the spirit will hopefully still be the same because it's coming from the same place and it's being right. made by the same people. Um, so that's that's been great fun. We've made hundreds of collectibles now over the years, yeah. um, and it, it's like every time I design a cool collectible because you know because I'm a collector myself, I'm like, yeah. oh man, I want to make something that design something that I would like to have in my house. So what I'm really doing. <laughs> is designing myself into awkward conversations that I'm going to have to have at some point when I try to bring some of the stuff home. Because the other thing about it is, you know, a lot of it ain't cheap, and especially at the yeah, moment, they're pretty um, the large too. A, uh, yeah, the world is going through a crazy time at the moment, so production costs are soaring, shipping costs are mm. soaring. So stuff that we could have made more affordable years ago now is is it's very challenging now to actually make it uh, affordable to the point of view to the point where where people can actually buy the stuff. So we try to do. We've got our crazy, oh my god, stuff, you know, the crazy mm-hmm. big stuff, and then we've got more accessible stuff as well, you know. Yeah. Um, I, for me, um, I love the miniature helmets, and you know, yeah. they're something that it's nice and classical. You can put on a shelf. They're not a huge monster roaring at you across the lounge off your right. mantelpiece. They're just a nice little museum piece. So, yeah. so I'm a huge fan of those, and 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 I, thankfully, we've been able over the years with a few pauses to just keep making little miniature helmets. And mm-hmm. lucky for us, in those movies, those six films, there's just like a bazillion different helmets that can be right. turned into little replicas. Um, so yeah, or hobbit holes for another example. Yeah. It's like. 50 or 40 something hobbit holes uh you right. know that still exist you know you can go and visit that as i'm sure your your listeners know yeah um so we make little replicas of them and and you know i can bring those home those are a little bit those are more within my price range and discretionary <laughs> yeah. spending range um right. where some of our other collectibles are more divorce worthy mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't we don't go there <laughs> yeah, the it's funny you bring up the Hobbit holes because uh, for years my 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 mom collected uh, like these um, from the movie It's a Wonderful Life. They had like all the buildings from It's a Wonderful Life, and she had them like on a shelf, but, like around our living room. And they'd come out every Christmas, and it was like the entire city. And I always thought like that's so silly. Why why would you have like all these things? And then you guys release these Hobbit holes, and I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Like I could see, I could see, you know, danger. Get a set of, danger. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> wrong. <"Hang on." laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're addictive. Yeah. Um, I think you know the thing for me as a collector that I, I to me those little things connect me with the media that I love. They're a way for me to express to my friends and family who visit. This is the thing that I love, and so yeah. here it is on my shelf. Yeah. But then they're also a way for me to be reminded of those moments in the films, or those stories that matter, and why they matter to me, why those characters matter, why those places matter. So um, that's that's why I find endless joy in these little silly little things. Yeah. Um, because they they do have meaning. They matter. Mm-hmm. And okay, there might only be five hundred people in the world who who agree with yeah. me that this thing, little <laughs> thing has has meaning and matters. 
but we're a little club and, yeah. and we enjoy them together. So yeah, it's yeah. it's great fun. And again, it, as I say, it keeps me in Middle Earth, keeps me playing on this mm -hmm. in this stuff. So this last year has been really fun because obviously it's the 20th anniversary of the Fellowship of the Ring. We've now transitioned into 2022. We've got a year of, of celebrating the two towers. Right. Um, so that's, it's been really cool to um, try and think of ways that we can uh, uh, acknowledge those films and and pick characters and moments from them that turn into collectibles. Mm. So that's what we're in the middle of doing at the moment. I just, just had a meeting about that before I came here. And I wish I could tell you what we were doing. Um, <laughs> we have to preserve some element of surprise. And also because, mm. because it's an unpredictable time at the moment, you know, the best laid plans yeah. sometimes get derailed. And so we can't, right. we don't want to promise stuff that then we can't deliver. Yeah. But, you know, it's actually, it's, you know what, it's actually just like working on the films because it's all the stuff that gets made. And then there's mm. the cutting room floor for movies and for collectibles, it's the same. There's the stuff that gets so far along and then for whatever reason, commercial realities kick mm -hmm. in, something and you have to pivot and and drop it and it doesn't get made and you're like uh, you know a lot of time and and heart you know has gone into it but it, it can't be and so be it so you know we, yeah. we don't know we, we have to be a little bit secretive sometimes and not show everybody everything we're doing we try to um, yeah well mate, yeah, so so surely we'll we'll have some form of two tower surprises in store maybe oh, yeah, you know maybe maybe uh you know I, i'm sure fans could uh you know, do their speculation and we'll see, see what happens when you guys release them. Obviously we have debuts of fun characters. You know, we get Rohan in two towers and uh tree beard and Gollum. So who knows? Maybe we'll see. Yep. We'll see some of those, okay. but. And yeah. I also would say if, if so, if somebody's listening to this and they love collecting this kind of stuff as well, it's, it can be a conversation too. Mm. So we want to, you know, uh, we're obviously very interested to hear what people want, what what matters to you, what would you like that you would like us to make? And, and you know, if there's enough interest in certain things, we can do it. Um, so so reach out you know there are there are forums there are there's our facebook page, pages there is there's or there's just emailing us you know yeah. but, but let us know what you want because ultimately we're all just fans celebrating our, our shared love of this world together um and certain things have more commercial viability than other things but wherever possible we'll try and do stuff uh that that matters to you and so yeah let us know what what you love and Hopefully we can we can make it for you. <laughs> Very cool. That is well. I'm sure people will take you up on that. So if you've got ideas out there, send us your lists. Send them to Weta. You might you might uh, be the little spark that uh, that starts starts a uh, new figure or um, statue collectible, what have you. Um, I will say one of my favorite. Um, you know, you mentioned the nice thing about the Hobbit holes is they're a little more budget friendly than some of the. The crazier pieces, you know, I saw the the huge Argonath that you guys are coming out with uh, here soon, and uh, um, another one that's that's a little easier on the pocketbook is the mini epics, and I absolutely oh, yes. adore the look of the mini epics. I was telling uh, Richard when I had him on that uh, my my dream would be to someday see, <clears throat> excuse me, an animated or stop motion series of the Lord of the Rings adapted in that style because I just love the <laughs> look of those. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up, actually. And so the mini epics uh, for years, we wanted, you know, we're doing obviously very serious stuff where we're replicating what's in the movie and where, where authenticity, fidelity is is critical. But we can also have a little bit of fun every now and again and just yeah. do some goofy stuff. And so for years, we were trying to come up with a, a stylized version of the Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. that we could make, you know, as you say, slightly more affordable, more quirky, more fun, little, little, we um, lower um, investment items mm -hmm. um, as collectibles. And, you know, I, I did many, many drawings. A lot of us did drawings. We did sculptures, you know, trying to come up with what it was. And we could never nail it quite right to the point where everybody agreed, that's it. That's the one. Let's make that. So there was always that hesitation. And, you know, honestly, this was, I, tell you the truth this was like a 10-year process we keep coming back to this idea trying to find a way to do it and then one of our uh, one of my colleagues Mauro Santini who's a phenomenal sculptor and designer um, was doing the stuff he just was drawing these cool little Hobbit and Lord of the Rings cartoons and then yeah. he's an amazing sculptor so he was making them in 3D you know and making these little characters uh, and 3D modeling programs and and he once he had a suite of a handful of them, he came in and showed them to Richard, and it was that there was that aha moment yeah. where everybody's like, 
that's the thing we've been chasing all these years. He's nailed it. And so yeah. Mauro immediately became the father of what we eventually called the mini epics range, which is these yeah. fun, quirky, little, we slightly cartoony versions of, of characters. And we started with Lord of the Rings and now Mauro's had the chance, uh, he and his partner, Hoakalina, have had the chance to um, explore lots of different IPs right. and give them the mini epics treatment. Yeah. Uh, I have nothing to do with the mini epics. I, I, get to be a, I just get to be a fan because yeah. I work like I sit like ten feet from them, and so I just get to see what they're what they're making and and you know and just uh, squee with glee when I see them yeah. uh, take characters that that I know so well mm -hmm. and give them a fresh a fresh and fun twist. And you know yeah. it's it's um, they're awesome. So yeah, I'm glad you brought up the mini epics. I love them. I, I get them. Uh, and, yeah, I'm just a huge fan of those. Yeah, they, I absolutely ad I love them. And uh, so, so something that's uh, kind of in a similar style. That correct me if I'm wrong. I believe you were involved in this as well. But yeah. the uh, uh, yeah. unexpected party board game. That's right. Uh, so I I just love the look of the. Again, it's you know kind of very similar in art style to the to the mini epics. So what was it like uh, when you guys decided to make a board game? So again, this speaks to the whole like um, whether as a filmmaking company, well, a special effects company, yes, but it's also many other things as well. And effectively, we're all just you nearly know, like making cool stuff. Uh, and so board games is one of those, as board games are cool. Yeah. <laughs> we all play them, we all love them. Uh, and so you know, we uh, we luckily got to explore trying making board games for a while. Uh, hopefully, there'll be more. Yeah. But um, the Hobbit board game was one one that came out of, the, of our sort of workshop uh, think tank of like, hey, what can we make? Um, and it's it's nice because it's a little lighthearted. Um, and so it was a perfect fit for using a mini epic style rather than create. We didn't want to use just movie art because that kind of mm -hmm. applies a, a heaviness to the game that we felt right. it's mo it's meant to be just a family fun game that you play in the yeah. evening. It's, it's you know, you basically the, the concept of the game is your dwarves showing up at Bilbo's house and winding them up. As yeah. they do, you know, the unexpected party at the beginning of the Hobbit, um, but it's done in a nice way where Bilbo thinks that they're destroying stuff, but they're actually cleaning up after yeah. themselves, and so that becomes apparent in the game. And the object of the game is to complete the song, all the verses of the song by pairing items with actions. It's kind of it's kind of cute. Yeah. And as your dwarf as your dwarf attracts more and more attention from Bilbo, you retire them and bring another one in. You know, another one shows up, and and then the the whole thing ends when when Thorin shows up and like you know, okay, down to business. Yeah. So it's it's taking one of those lighthearted moments from the movies and turning it into a fun game as opposed to a board game where you're just you know trying to slay monsters and stuff like right. that. We didn't that might happen someday too but that yeah. wasn't the intent of this game. So being a little bit more whimsical the mini epics were the perfect kind of um, opportunity to express that visually because they have that energy to them already. Mm -hmm. um, I so I it was my job basically because these were characters that we had not yet seen in mini epics form yet with the uh, exception of Gandalf um, I got the job to try and interpret these dwarf characters and Bilbo in many epic form. Now, I, I'm i not Mauro, Ho, Mauro Santini or Hohelina Ayimi. They, they are geniuses. And so I tried <laughs> to do my version of many epics and honor it. It's not quite the same. I think the aesthetic oh, is maybe it's really good, yeah. it's, it's close, but like if... Oh. I've seen what Mauro's version or Hochelina's version of Thorin looks like, for example. You know, I've seen, and I may be letting a cat out of the bag there, but mm. I've said it now, so I'm going to get in trouble when I get back to the office. But <laughs> there is, there is, a, there is a, a mini epic of Thorin coming at some oh, point. Oh, I love it. And I've seen it. And, and, as, and as much as I thought I could come up with what that should look like when I was designing, drawing for the illustrations for the game, the version they've come up with is so much cooler. And, if, and I look at it and go, well, of course it should look like that. That's so much yeah. better. But anyway, so the game is my attempt at trying to, trying to uh, create, you know, versions of all the dwarves. Um, and, and sort of, I would call them mini epics light style. They're mm -hmm. a little bit more, more um, goofy cartoony than perhaps the mini epics are. Uh, they're not quite as sophisticated, <laughs> design, <laughs> but they make fun game pieces. It's, so oh yeah, they, absolutely. It's a fun game. My, I, uh, my one of my youngest, my youngest uh, kid got to play test it with us, which was great fun. So mm. yeah, it was a really yeah. enjoyable process making a game. Oh yeah, absolutely. Game. Yeah, I got to do it. Yeah, my kids love it. I, I've got uh, little kids, and we play uh, board games all the time. We play, you know. Uh, 
like the Harry Potter Hogwarts battle game and uh, oh. yeah, unexpected uh, unexpected parties up there too. So um, you guys did a great <laughs> awesome. job with that one, as you guys do with everything, obviously. Um, Thank you. So uh, we're we're getting close to the to the end of our time here. I uh, at the end of these, I always do sign, kind of like a rapid fire, um, mm, just to, okay, to, cool. to ask you some uh, Middle Earth questions. I'm really excited to ask you because uh, you know you are such a Tolkien book nerd. So um, so I'll fa- try I'll try to keep my answers short because as we've <laughs> seen so far, I'm not very good at that. No, we don't know how to make short right. movies. <laughs> we don't we we don't know I don't know answer questions quickly either. So we'll see how we go. <laughs> well, I I never complain. You know, when it comes to Middle Earth, I'll take as much as as I can get, no matter what. You know, very gracious. When people, gracious. When people uh, people rumored like, oh yeah, Peter Jackson's got an extra hour that isn't included in Return of the King. I was like, I will I will sit down and watch a five and a half hour <laughs> Return of the King. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so. First question is, what uh, is your favorite Middle Earth book? Silmarillion. And what is your favorite Middle Earth character? Treebeard. Treebeard. Oh, okay. That makes sense, given our, <laughs> our previous conversation. Um, and if if you want to elaborate, feel free to elaborate. You don't have to do single single word responses. So don't I don't I don't want you to have all this pent up nerdiness, you know, that you don't get to express. Um, where you think I, you think I have difficulty expressing my nerdiness? Is that what you're saying? No, not at all. I don't think that's a. I don't think my wife would agree that that's a problem. <laughs> all right, where in Middle Earth would you choose to live? Oh man. Um, I think I'm going to say the Shire, because, and I know it's a boring answer because lots of people probably say that. But I just I was lucky enough to go there just recently. Mm. I mean, we're we're so lucky that that um, they were able to actually turn Hobbiton into a permanent attraction, yeah. and that and that now you can go and visit it and spend time there and go and sit in the Green Dragon and have a drink. So and cool. I think the tour the tour that you run that you do. Have you ever done it? I have oh, not. I've never been to New Zealand. It's on my it's on my bucket it. list. <laughs> Yeah, please. You got to do it. Uh, it um, I think it's about two hours, maybe two and a half hours that you go around. It's walking around Hobbiton with your guide, and then you end up at the Green Dragon, and you get to have either a, you know, an ale or or a ginger beer or or whatever cider, yeah. um, and a little bite to it. It's so cool. But just, um, I got to go up there and do a promotional piece for our newest collectible, which is a, a gigantic, epic version of Bag End yeah. to celebrate the twentieth anniversary of Fellowship. Um, and so we had a day up there uh, filming this little wee piece and the, we got the filming done so quickly that we just got to hang out for the day before our flight home. And so, and it was a day where there were hardly any tourists. Uh, they had an event happening that evening. They were going to screen the Fellowship of the Ring in the party field. Oh. So um, so they didn't have many tours. And so I and, and Leonard Ellis, who makes most of the little, Leonard's one of the guys who makes the little miniature hobbit holes that you have. Mm-hmm. Um, we just got to spend a couple of hours wandering around Bag Air and um, the Hob- Hobbiton yeah. without a guide, just with our cameras and just like <laughs> looking at each other, just going, how cool is this? We're <laughs> in Middle Earth. <laughs> and everywhere you look, like the illusion is not broken. You just, yeah. it's, you're in that place. So man, if I, 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 I wish you could move in there and actually stay there. It'd be amazing to Gosh. actually like, rent a room there. Yeah. But the problem is nobody would ever leave. And so right. you just fill up. Uh. (laughs) that was one of the first things when i when i learned that uh you know that they had made that permanent after the hobbit films i my immediate follow-up question was like wait can you stay in one of the hobbit holes (laughs) yeah and and i i wish i wish you could but i guess it's probably not in their interest to do so for that problem that you'd you'd never get rid of people so right yeah (laughs) (laughs) and they want to move people through as quickly as possible you know get the next the next two of us coming in right um, so if you lived in Middle Earth, what race of being would you be? Ah, uh, see, I, I'm sure I'm with other people too. I'm, I'd be like, oh, I'd want to be an elf, you know, because you just strut around and you're kind of immortal and all this kind of stuff. But, but I, I don't think I, I don't. And I tried to be an elven extra a couple of times with mm. limited success. Um, <laughs> but, but. Um, I don't know I, I come kind of drawn to Rohan, right? I'm trying to mm. kind of drawn to the world of men and to that to that culture. I um, yeah. of all the races in Middle Earth and the movies, I felt like that was the one that felt the most real. Mm-hmm. Um, 
<clears throat> and partly because it's probably the one that's actually grounded the most closely in real earth cultures. But that yeah. uh, Edoras felt like a place that you could actually go and live and and that was a real place. Yeah, so yeah. I think I'd, I'd probably be a, uh, uh, I'd, I'd probably be like some stable hand or something yeah. and, and, and I can't ride a horse. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to be just cleaning up after them and yeah. watching them ride out. But that's cool. It's the yeah. place has got a cool view. So, you know, while I'm mucking out the stables and throwing stuff over the, you know, muck over the cliff, I get to look out of that incredible view and enjoy it. So I'd be happy. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's interesting you bring up Rohan because, you know, with all the, 20th of fellowship celebrations and you know a lot of people you know when you when they ask me um you know what's your what's your favorite uh lord of the rings film i'm like oh well you know fellowship was the one that started all but if you go with fellowship then you don't get anything of rohan you don't get that awesome you know howard shore track and you know return the king though stuck the landing and like you know it, i i always take the cop out of like I see it as one film. So Lord of the Rings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. That's a yeah. fair answer. I'm with you. So uh, where in Middle Earth would you choose to visit? So not live, but if you could go visit at any particular time in Middle Earth history. So, you know, obviously, you know, people who answer Casa Dooms usually specify pre-Balrog unleashing. Yeah, it's not as much fun to visit once the Balrog's moved in. Right. Um, uh, I think I'd go to Lothlorien because, man, that's a cool. That'd be a cool place to visit. But I'm a little bit. I, I'm not so good with heights. So, so like, it'd be fun to go up those trees once, right. shake hands, with Caliborn, <laughs> and then about five minutes later, you know, once I've looked at the view for a little bit, go straight back down again, where I feel <clears throat> a little bit safer with my feet on the ground. So I'd visit. I'd visit Lothlorien and I'd take a ridiculous amount of, of photographs and selfies. But I'd be happy to go back home. Yeah. Mm. Uh, what of, of, so this could be of any of the six middle earth films. Um, do you have a favorite scene? Hmm. I think the Rivendell stuff is pretty magical in fellowship of the ring. And I think also because it comes, it's a moment where as an audience member watching the film, you've just had all this like tension. Mm -hmm. And then you just get this, just catch a breath for a minute and walk around in a place that is that you know is completely safe and it's beautiful, um, and and mystical and and enticing and and there's mystery there and there's history. That's I think that's one of my favourite points watching the film just because of that that release of tension. It's the moment where you you realise you've been you've been sitting forward and gritting and you're like, okay, we're good. But I, I think I love it for that. Great. Um, do you have a, uh, this is the last question. So um, do you have a favorite memory or story from your time? Obviously there's been a significant number of years we're talking about here, but from your time on the six Middle Earth films, do you have a favorite memory or story? There's a fun one. Um, I don't know if it's a favorite, but it's a fun story. Um, when we were designing the weapons, and it's, it, this is, shows you how things evolve and change and somehow what you think is awful actually ends up being kind of cool. Um, we were designing elven weaponry. And so for that, we actually brought in experts in fighting techniques because when you design a weapon, you need to know how it's, how it's going to be used yeah. or else you're just making stuff up willy-nilly. So, mm -hmm. so we brought people in to sort of suggest ways in which different cultures could move that would be distinct. And, and the thing that, that would, became apparent was for the elves, there was something really, really cool about a culture that, that moved with uh, incredible efficiency, but, um, but also a tremendous grace. And so they, had, so they developed these wonderful big sort of sweeping moves. And so yeah. what made sense was when you're doing big sweeping moves, uh, a, a slightly curved weapon makes perfect yeah. sense. And so, um, and so that naturally led us, and because we were exploring that sort of whiplash line, that Art Nouveau style, it sort of led us to, to weaponry that was that shape as well, which, which brought in an, an Eastern influence, which was really quite lovely because most of the Lord of the Rings um, materials draw from Northern European histories. Right. And so those are the natural places you look, look at for, for reference materials and for inspiration. But to have a slightly, dare I say, exotic influence coming in from the East through the Elves, Mm -hmm. um, exotic, at least, as in 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 
comparison with, say, Gondor or Rohan or, or the Hob or Hobbits, which are very English feeling, um, yeah. that had a really lovely quality. And so we so we started looking at things like katana, um, mm -hmm. you know, Japanese weapons and and that sort of thing. So. So the guys actually mocked up this beautiful um, curved katana-like blade, um, and that and Peter Jackson loved it and said, "Yeah, that's the um, that's going to be the uh, the Elven sword." And 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 very much like we talked about with Arwen's sword, which is a slightly yeah. lighter version of it. It had it had a, a, a grip for one hand, mm -hmm. and then had a blunt area at the beginning of the blade where you could use a two-handed grip, and there was a little kick to stop you from sliding your hand up and, and cutting yourself. And that was mm -hmm. Elrond's sword. Basically, is exactly what it, what it was. If, if, yeah. if anybody's familiar with, well, that's that's Elrond's sword. Sorry, not Elrond's yeah. Hel Heldir's sword, I should say. Mm. Yeah, is basically what that sword was going to be. Um, and so the, the stunt guys wanted to start practicing with it. And all we had at the time was an aluminium version of it. Um, mm. And and they were like, well, we don't want to use that. Somebody would hurt themselves with that. So we didn't have time to to make a lightweight replica of it at the time. So what we did was basically we gave it to one of the guys and uh, he wrapped a bunch of foam around the handle <laughs> and taped it, you know, literally with the uh, tape. Um, and then he and then he curved a piece of a large piece of got a sheet of foam and like a, a like a you know half an inch thick and just mm -hmm. folded it in half and stapled it down the end around <laughs> the blade. And so what this did was it took this beautiful, elegant, narrow, narrow katana and turned it into something with a huge, great big <laughs> wide blade like this. It looked like a machete. Yeah. <laughs> and because he because he wrapped the the handle all the way up, including the blunt part of the blade, it went from having a handle this this big. And a blade this big to being a, a handle this big and a blade the same size. Yeah. And so it just completely changed the weapon. But that was fine because it was just a practice thing for the sword guys to 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 play with and get some mm -hmm. shapes going. Except Peter comes along and sees the guys practicing with him. He's like, "What's that?" Because um, it doesn't look anything like the sword that he approved. Right. And I'm like, oh, don't worry, Pete. It's just it's just a mock up for the guys to use. And he's like, he's like, no, I love it. I've never seen a sword like that before. It looks like a garden implement, you know, it's like something you use to cut your weeds with. <laughs> um, and he's like, that's the new Elven sword. And we're like, what? No. What about our beautiful katana that we designed? And he's like, oh, forget that. This is way cooler. We're using that. And, and like I and my colleagues in the design farm, <laughs> that was it. We were weak. We were like, no. But it, it, the elves are all about grace and fluidity. Mm -hmm. And here's this thing that looks like you cut weeds with it, right? It's just, yeah. just this massive, big, ugly thing. Um, but, okay, once we kind of recovered from the initial shock, we looked at it, okay, tried to understand what it was that Peter liked about it. What he liked mm -hmm. was the unusual shape to it, that, that it was something mm -hmm. different. And so we, we managed to talk him back down and get it a little bit slimmer than what the original one was. So it didn't look like such an ax. Um, uh, and we ended up with this, this really unusual looking sword with this huge, great big long handle on it. And then this, this long curved blade, but, but quite wide. Mm -hmm. Um, and while initially we were all resistant to it, once the, the stunt guys started working with it and were doing all those cool shapes, like actually, it's actually kind of cool. Yeah. It's, and, and that's how you get that wonderful shot in the prologue sequence of the Fellowship of the Ring where the elves are all standing there with this thing yes. and the orcs come running and they do that, they do that amazing swish that I can't do and, you know, lob <laughs> off a bunch of heads and the whole audience goes, you know, because yeah. that's that. You're, you're, at that point in the film, you're still like, "What is this? I don't really get this," you know. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, they do this cool move, and like, "Oh, that's pretty yeah. cool." Yeah. Uh, it's, I think it's the point where a lot of people get grabbed. Mm -hmm. um, so it took that. That's one of my favorite stories because it, it took something beautiful, turned into mm -hmm. something hor horrific, and then <laughs> kind of became something really cool and beautiful and unexpected again. Um, yeah. And we still got to have our lovely narrow sword because mm -hmm. uh, basically our own slash Arwen sword is that and Haldir's sword is that. And then the swords we end up with the elves having the hobbits, basically that. So we got to have our cake and we got to eat it at the same time. Oh, yeah. And that's such a fantastic shot. Oh, my gosh. that is That is definitely one of those moments that that grabs you even now after I've seen the movie dozens of times, I actually just recently went to a local screening of fellowship in a theater oh, cool. just because it was playing. And uh, I, it was the one film that I had not seen of middle earth in theaters because I was so late to the game. Yeah. So like, and you know, had just never, uh, you know, hit it right to like catch a screening. And so, um, you know, I'm sitting there watching the prologue, just smiling ear to ear. And when it gets to that shot, I'm like, oh, this shot is so freaking good. <laughs> yeah. And the sound design is great in that scene, yeah. too. So 
get to see it at the cinema. I mean, it's a very different experience than seeing it on your television, you know, with whatever sure. good speakers you might have. Seeing it actually on the big screen and hearing those amazing effects of the score, yeah, it's it's a great experience. I'm so glad you got to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I'm very much looking forward to, uh, you know, obviously we celebrated uh, Fellowship of the Rings 20th and this year. It's it's great because we get just like back in the day where we had three years <laughs> of uh, Lord of the Rings. We kind of get to do the whole thing over again, celebrating the 20th anniversary um, of each of these. Um, but uh, Daniel, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you so much for joining us today. You know, this was an absolutely fantastic conversation. I love nerding out with you over the books and the films and, <laughs> you know, you. Uh, getting to hear all your amazing insight from your your time in Middle Earth, which is still going on, obviously. Yeah, it's oh, thank you very much. Oh, look, it's I never get tired of talking about this stuff, and I and I'm also just always profoundly grateful for the privilege of getting to be part of this world, to take a book that I read as a kid and love, and and get to attach myself in some small way to that universe, and and as you say to use your parlance, which I use all the time, to nerd out about it with people is a tremendous honor. One, I, I'm so thankful that people are interested in what we did and, and that it resonated with them. Uh, that, that means so much to me because it, well, that was always the goal. Um, and I love that we get to keep enjoying it all these years later. Uh, so I hope there's more of it to come. Yeah, it's, it's been good fun. I, and anytime you want to nerd out, man, even if it's off the air, yeah, let me know because I'm, I'm there for it. <laughs> Excellent. Well, yeah, we'll definitely have you back for sure because cool. this is Look this has been delightful. It. I I'd love to, you know, maybe we can do a, a dive into two towers uh, sometime later this year that and um, really dial into that. You know, we get to talk about your favorite character, Treebeard, some more. Um, yeah, I think that'd be that'd be great fun. In the meantime, you know, we'll uh, we'll cross our fingers for that 25th anniversary Mithril edition or yes. or sooner maybe and. Uh, <laughs> And maybe in the interim, we'll get a, uh, you know, uh, GDT um, Hobbit Chronicles. Right. <laughs> volume so. 7, so. Volume 7 uh, Hobbit Chronicles of uh, Guillermo del Toro. But, um, well, Daniel, thank you so much again Thanks, for joining man. us. Um, it's been a blast. Um, everyone, uh, you know, you can go to uh, Weta's website to um, check out their line of collectibles and, I'm sure you know you've seen their their work in countless films over the years with all the insane special effects that they're up to and uh, all the great work they do. Um, and like Daniel said, reach out to them, shoot them an email, uh, check them on social media, and uh, let them know your ideas. If you have ideas for collectibles, um, you know you heard Daniel say it here. They're they're open to ideas, and you never know that that could turn into something that uh, that pops up on the website. So. Check it definitely out. has in the past definitely has in the past we've got a fantastic wonderfully engaged fan base there's a, a fantastic community of collectors that, that that have been amazingly loyal to us and, and you know we don't take that for granted yeah. um, and you know they've, they've come up with some amazing ideas that, that we've been able to make a commercial reality and, and offer back so it's a win-win for all of us so yeah thank you again thank thanks you. Matt for having me really appreciate it it's a privilege hopefully Absolutely. we talk again real soon Definitely. We definitely will. Well, everyone, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.